Good morning, everybody. My name is Henry Walter, and I'm the president of the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the fourth biennial Dreyfus Foundation Teacher Scholar Symposium. This symposium is always enjoyable and thought-provoking, with so many distinguished chemists from around the country coming together to exchange information and ideas. Some of you got off to a good start la at last night's welcoming reception, and we look forward to continuing those conversations today. We're all here due to common connections between the chemical sciences and the Dreyfus Foundation. Many of you are Camille and Henry Dreyfus Teacher Scholars. The Teacher Scholar Award is the Foundation's flagship program. The award was initiated in 1970 and recognizes the independent research and teaching accomplishments of promising young faculty in the chemical sciences. The award has recognized and provided support for 850 talented young scientists, many of whom have gone on to make significant contributions to the field. Some of the ways in which the newest awardees are embarking on exciting directions are described in the brief videos that the New York Teacher Scholars produced in advance of this symposium. For those of you who have not yet seen them, these videos are all posted on the Foundation's website and YouTube. I watched all of them and was impressed with both their quality and the important work that is being done. They give a wonderful sense of the directions in which the field is headed and how that work may impact all of us. Before we begin the main program, we will present a brief video of our own, um, which provides some background about the Dreyfus Brothers, as well as the Foundation's history and programs. Somebody in charge of the video? <laughs> As the 20th century dawned, all fabrics were natural. But chemists had a dream to develop and manufacture new materials with exceptional properties. Two Swiss-born brothers, Camille and Henry Dreyfus, pursued that dream while working on their PhDs in chemistry at the University of Basel. They started with cellulose, the tough, insoluble fiber found in trees. Henry Walter, foundation president and member of the Dreyfus family, explains how they began. The first uh, innovation was trying to replace cellulose nitrate and produce something that wasn't as flammable. The answer was cellulose acetate. But before they could develop it into a fiber, World War I broke out. The Dreyfus brothers provided the Allies with non-flammable coatings for airplanes. After the war, they did something like 20,000 experiments, resulting in a fiber that could be woven and dyed. Their company, Celanese, became a pillar of the synthetic textile industry. By mid-century, the company grew to be one of the world's largest. Their dyeable, award-winning silk-like fiber became a fashion staple. Cellulose is very difficult to use. You have to act on it very vigorously. The Dreyfus brothers broke it down with acetic anhydride. Acetate reacts with hydroxyl groups on cellulose sugars so that cellulose acetate now becomes soluble in a whole range of solvents, making it a lot easier to shape and form. One important use was movie film which solved a huge problem for the movie industry because earlier versions of uh, movie film would burst into flames. Cellulose acetate is still in use today in product design and in 3D printers. Henry died in 1944. In his memory, Camille started the Dreyfus Foundation in 1946, explaining why in a letter. We shared together the sweat and tears 
of labor and disappointment and the joys of achievement. Henry was to me my loyal, true, and dearly beloved brother. In 1949, the name of the foundation was changed to the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation to link both brothers forever in promoting chemistry, the field they loved so well. Camille Dreyfus knew what he wanted the foundation to do. He said the foundation's goals were to advance the science of chemistry chemical engineering and related sciences as a means of improving human circumstances and relations. The foundation programs are designed to identify scientists at important stages of their careers. The, the important thing for the Dreyfus Foundation is not to see the future, but rather to enable the future to unfold. One program is the Environmental Postdoctoral Fellowship. That was in many ways a gateway to allow PhDs in physical chemistry, for example, to move directly into an arena that collided basic science with public policy change. The Dreyfus Prize recognizes major chemistry achievements with a $250,000 award. One characteristic of the Dreyfus Prize is that it's an area which transcends subdisciplinary boundaries. The inaugural prize was awarded to Harvard materials chemist George Whitesides in 2009. I'd say George Whitesides is one of the best in the world in taking achievements from one area of chemistry and applying them in another area. The virtue of chemistry is that is it easy? I don't know whether it's easy, but it is always interesting. Our task, and one of the things that the Dreyfus Foundation has been very good at doing, is to provide the safety for the young people to at least try some of those things. And I think the community has to be enormously grateful to institutions like Dreyfus for making that possible. The Teacher Scholar Program supports young professors who have proven themselves early in their careers as researchers and teachers. Two very distinguished current board members received Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Awards in the early 1980s. Marianne Fox eventually became the Chancellor of the University of California, San Diego. Matthew Terrell is now leading the University of Chicago's first engineering school. Many teacher scholars went on to win some of chemistry's highest awards. And today's teacher scholars are equally talented. They are pushing the frontiers of chemistry. The Dreyfus brothers' legacy lives on. Both brothers felt that chemistry could help improve the world. The Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation focuses entirely on chemistry, so in that way we are distinct. For the size of the foundation, which is substantial but not enormous, it has a tremendously positive impact on the chemical sciences and on the public appreciation of what chemistry can do for humanity. Well, that's our video and we like to get a critique from the experts later. <laughs> it is indeed a special occasion to have you all together here today. We have a remarkable program of speakers and presenters. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the New York Academy of Sciences for allowing us to use this impressive facility. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our executive director, Dr. Mark Cardillo, and our staff, Jerry Brandenstein and Adam Lohr, for their hard work in organizing this symposium. And of course, thanks again to all of you, and a special thanks to our speakers that we, you will hear later. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Matthew Tyrell, who is the Dean and Founding Pritzker Director of the Institute for Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. He also serves as Ch Chair of the Foundation's Scientific Affairs Committee. 
and, as you saw in the video, a Dreyfus uh, teacher scholar. Matt. Thanks a lot, Hank. It's uh, a really a pleasant uh, duty that I have now to introduce our first speaker, Christy Anseth from the University of Colorado, who I've known since she uh, took up her first faculty position um, in 1996. She uh, received her PhD also from the University of Colorado in 94 and then did a two-year postdoc with Bob Langer uh, and came back to Colorado in 96 uh, and is, uh, as it's mentioned in the program, a, 2000, a, a year 2000 teacher scholar awardee. She is now the Tisone Distinguished Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, Surgery, and uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator. Um, her work has really been phenomenally productive and influential in the development of biomaterials, uh, scaffolds, hydrogels with highly controlled uh, architectures, chemistry for 3D structures, um, for 3D cell culture, tissue engineering, biological assays. Um, Christy has always been at the forefront of applying new chemistries to the biomaterials field, and this is how her influence has played out. Uh, building on her Teacher Scholar Award in 2000, uh, she's now been uh, uh, elected to all three national academies, engineering, science, and medicine is the author uh, of uh, well over 300 publications and is going to talk to us about cellular control in a couple of clicks. All right, thank you for the, the kind introduction. And um, before I begin, uh, what I would uh, say is that I, I started my career, I trained in chemical engineering. And my PhD was in this area of polymerization reactions and, and making different types of polymeric materials with controlled properties. And um, I hadn't had a biology class before, high since high school, when I graduated in 94. And I jumped in and did a postdoc with Bob Langer and became very interested in how one could use different types of reactions, in particular photochemical reactions, to design new types of materials and chemistries that could be done in the presence of living systems. And um, at the time, the field of tissue engineering, regenerative medicine was burgeoning. And I was trying to bravely write many proposals in this area where, where many people thought that some of the ideas were maybe a little naive, um, maybe trying to push too far and crossing different boundaries, um, interacting with biologists, medical clinicians, chemists, and, and engineers. And so um, when that letter came, we still had letters back then from the Dreyfus Foundation that I was selected to receive the Teacher Scholar Award, um, it meant a lot to me and it had a big impact on, on my career. It, it gave me some confidence to pursue some of these ideas, but more importantly, some seed funds so we could get some of those key experiments done and invest in people in my lab and give them the freedom and ability to be brave in exploring this frontier. So I wanted to uh, say a special thank you to the foundation. I think it's impacted many of us in our careers. So what I'd like to tell you about today is um, walk you through a little bit about where we've landed um, 15 years later from when I, I, I got that letter. And we've been very interested in this area where um, of, of cellular therapeutics. So the idea that was burgeoning at the time was using one's own cells to get the body to heal itself when processes had gone awry. And of course now we have many different sources of cells that one can use uh, in pursuit of that goal. Um, and perhaps the ideas weren't necessarily so new in the first place in that blood transfusions have been around for decades <laughs> and saving many people's lives. Some of you may have known people that have had bone marrow transplants 
to treat certain types of cancers. More recently, um, the Edmonton Protocol uh, takes a donor pancreas and gets the islets that make insulin and they'll transplant those islets into patients that have diabetes that's very severe and can't be regulated by insulin injections. So another cell-based therapy. Um, we also now have products where one can take your own cartilage cells, your own chondrocytes, and inject them into surfaces of joints that have damaged cartilage tissue and regenerate that tissue in a controlled fashion. So we're starting to see more and more of this expanding in the field. And in fact, if you look at the FDA's website, you'll find tens of thousands of clinical trials of ways to inject cells into patients to try to alleviate debilitating symptoms of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's or into patients' hearts after they've had a heart attack with the hopes of trying to repair or regenerate some of that last cardiac muscle. So in that context, though, some of the motivation and themes in our work are that while these cell-based therapies, we think, are going to continue to grow and we're going to learn more and there'll be more medical products, many times these treatments are, are suboptimal because when you inject those cells, oftentimes only a few percentage of them survive. It's called engraftment, so they integrate with the tissue and survive and function. And that's a tremendously low amount. And that leads to many suboptimal types of treatments. And so one can envision that our bodies are much more than 100 trillion cells, but instead they're embedded in a tissue, in a material environment. So one can think of that as complementary to all the advancements in cell biology and stem cell biology. We need a corresponding advancement in ways of new types of materials that could be used to deliver those cells or expand them in vitro or design new models of tissue disease. And so from that perspective, um, what new materials, chemistry, and engineering are, are needed to, to enable this? And so the way that we tend to think about this is we, we think about these cells being embedded in a microenvironment or a niche and if one can embed them in these cells in three dimensions, those scaffolds can serve as a framework upon which those cells can regenerate and, and regrow tissue structures. Here I'm showing a, a picture of cartilage is what some of our early work was focused on, was regenerating cartilage. But the field became stuck a little bit. We were able to regenerate tissues that had certain mechanical properties, like cartilage that's a, a low friction cushioning surface on moving joints. We were able to regenerate skin that could be useful for patients that had burns over large areas of their body, but mostly the barrier properties of that skin. We couldn't regenerate and innervate it or the hair follicles and whatnot. And you know, the challenges become more difficult. We, we still don't know enough to get a small uh, injury to the spinal cord, a very small uh, injury, to regrow and integrate across the, that gap. We're very far away from being able to regenerate something like a uh, small unit of your liver or your kidney that could be useful for patients that had failure of those organs. Um, so those types of tissues are complex and they have many different chemistry functions, metabolic functions associated with them. So this is where I think material chemistry and polymer chemistry and biomaterial science can play a big role because we need to learn more about how do these cells get information from that surrounding environment and how does that outside information get translated to the nucleus of the cell and control something important. If I want those cells to grow in number, if they want them to secrete and make a tissue, if I'd like them to differentiate into a specialty cell type. And it's not just about learning which signals are, are needed, but in what context and on what time scale. So uh, this is the space that, that we're very interested in. And there are many different types of materials one can use for, for this uh, type of application and answering these types of questions. 
And so one that my group has been very interested in is a class called uh, hydrogel systems. And here I'm just showing a macroscopic picture of a hydrogel. Uh, from a very simple sense, if you could see the molecular level details of this hydrogel, it's composed of long macromolecular chains that would normally dissolve in water, but because of interactions between those chains, it renders the material insoluble and instead it imbibes large amounts of water, it swells. Now these classes of materials are very nice for embedding cells in. Here I'm showing some cells that I loaded up with a fluorescent dye so that you could see them. And so I can look at these cells embedded in here under the, the microscope. And this high water content is desirable because many times cells are secreting molecules to one another. Um, and this is very important for how they communicate. So many different growth factors called chemokines and cytokines. Many times when I'm culturing these, either inside, outside the body or if I'm putting them inside, there are exogenous signals that I might want to deliver. And because of the high water content, those molecules can be transported very, very quickly. In fact, many of the soft tissues in our body have high water content. That also gives some very interesting mechanical properties to these materials. And we're learning more and more about how cells receive mechanical cues from, from this environment. So it becomes equally important to control the chemistry and the mechanics in this microenvironment. So then now some of the questions become, what materials should I use and what kind of signals do I need to, to give to these cells and on what contextual way and time scales and spatial scales should they be delivered. Now, there are also many different types of hydrogels and one that we happen to have worked with quite a bit are these polyethylene glycol hydrogels. So here's PEG and one can imagine modifying the ends of PEGs with many different reactive groups. Um, one of the early ones we worked on were just these acrylate end groups where these macromolecules could be dissolved right in the presence of cells in a suspension. And then we would do different types of initiation reactions, many times light-based or redox-based so that one wouldn't have to change the temperature or pH when you're doing reactions in the presence of, of cells. That's one of the, the main constraints. Um, and so one could polymerize these chains and form a hydrogel network right uh, in the presence of cells and encapsulate them. And PEG is nice for a couple of reasons. It, uh, it's widely used in human medicine, used to modify many different types of proteins and small molecules to change their availability and their distribution in the body. And it's also one of the, the synthetic materials that when you put it in a complex mixture of proteins, um, again, whether that's in the body or outside the body when you're culturing cells, it resists a lot of nonspecific absorption of those proteins. And that's important because if you want to understand how a cell receives a signal from outside, you don't want to have that signal that you're going to introduce blanketed by an absorption nonspecifically of different proteins. So it's very useful from that perspective as well. But if you just use a PEG-based material, what happens is that cells don't recognize this chemistry. Proteins don't nonspecifically absorb to this very well. So cells, when they're embedded in this type of hydrogel environment, they tend to take out a spherical morphology. And there are some cells in our body where this is very uh, physiologic. So these happen to be the chondrocytes found in cartilage tissue, and this is the way that they look and they build this lacunae around them and they secrete and make cartilage matrix. So these gels can be very nice for these types of applications. It's also really good when you want to promote cell-cell interactions rather than cell material or cell matrix interactions. And so here's a cluster of the cells found in your pancreas, those ones that make insulin, the, the islets. So PEG gels can be very useful for this, but many, many cells in our body get information, they require information from this extracellular environment. And so here I'm showing you a picture of um, some cells found in your bone marrow that are capable of responding to injury and helping to repair bones and cartilage and they also migrate throughout your body. 
And if you put these cells inside of a PEG gel, what happens is they want to spread, but they don't find anything to attach to. They're trying to move to one another, but they're inhibited by the interactions of the PEG gel and they can't break it down with any of their enzymes that they know how to make. And instead, these cells, after a day or two, are going to undergo a programmed cell death called anoecus because of lack of interactions with that material environment. So this is then the perfect opportunity where we can begin to think about trying to consider these niches of adding in chemistries to try to uh, make a material system that could better mimic what these cells would experience in their niche in the body. So we think about these matrices where first we have this blank slate of a PEG gel and on the one hand, so I title was cellular control and a couple of clicks, we're interested in different types of click reactions where we can add in chemical functionality that the cells will recognize and learn specifically how cells respond to those signals. And we might want to do this in a way that's sequential, introduce one signal at one time and another at a different time, or spatially with, with gradients and different types of uh, uh, patterns. And so that's one of the reasons I'll tell you a little more about some of the photoclick reactions we've been interested in. But in cellular environments, it's not just about adding cues. Many times it's as important when those cues go away. Um, and so we also have been interested in some complementary reactions. That's the removal of that signal, the cleavage of it, so-called photoclip reactions, where we introduce groups that contain linkers that can be cleaved upon exposure to light. And we can use this to not only remove chemistry, but also as a way to break down our, our material and control degradation in a spatially defined manner. So let's start over here with just some of these click reactions. And um, I'll give one more background slide, and then I'll, I'll give you an example of where, where we use some of this. So many of you in the audience uh, have looked at some of the poster titles. I, I know that you work in this space and are do doing some very creative work in designing different types of click reactions that can be used to conjugate different types of biological molecules. And that's really what we're interested in as well, is how can we click in biological molecules into this PEG-based background? And over the last decade or so, there's been an explosion of different types of chemical conjugation reactions that are considered uh, bio-click reactions. So these are reactions that proceed with high specificity oftentimes in a complex milieu of many different molecules. Um, they can be controlled in a, in a manner that allows them to be performed in living systems. And in particular, my group has been very interested in this thialene bio-click reaction and have, have been in, involved in using this in biomaterial development. And the reason we're interested in that one is because of it's one of the few click reactions that can be photochemically driven or photochemically initiated. So I'll tell you a tiny bit about this chemistry. But using this, what we're very interested in are designing these hydrogel precursors, these macromolecules, and then we put these end groups onto this so that we can click together our hydrogel networks where we can now begin to think about introducing biological functionality. So I'm going to walk you through in the, the next 20 minutes or so some different vignettes of how we use this. So let's start here where we look at a tissue regeneration problem where we're very interested in how can we help bones heal faster, especially when they're critical size such as if you've had a major car accident or if you've had a tumor in your bone that's had to be removed. And so in doing that, I showed you that picture of those bone marrow cells that are very important in the healing process. So we began to become interested in how could we design something to promote uh, bone regeneration by mimicking some key features that are found in the matrix that forms when a wound happens in our body. And so in this native tissue, tissue matrix, some of the key functionalities that are important is that there are adhesive proteins that the cells can bind to. And oftentimes they'll get survival cues from this. There are also linkers that can be degradable by enzymes or proteases secreted by the cells. And they decide on demand when to degrade and remodel this tissue. 
And then there are also different types of sequences that can serve as a reservoir for um, binding different growth factors, and they're released on demand by cells when it has to repair a tissue. So we began to think about trying to mimic or capture some of these, these basic functions into our PEG hydrogels. And in the biomaterials community, many people use peptides as mimics of some of these full proteins that are found in the native tissue matrix. So the reason that these peptides are nice is one can use an instrument, a solid phase peptide synthesizer, to make these short repeat units found in proteins. And we know, for example, on many adhesive proteins, we know the exact regions that cells bind to such as this RDD sequence found in fibronectin and many different adhesive proteins. Here's a sequence that's found in collagen, and certain matrix metalloproteinases that these cells make can degrade this sequence very efficiently. And we can also pan through many different libraries of peptides and find ones that will bind some of the growth factors that we might want to use to stimulate our cells to make the bone re repair faster. This one happens to bind to one of the um, BMP families that's involved with bone regeneration, uh, TGF-beta. So the idea then is for our click reaction, we're going to use this thiolene reaction, which is photochemically driven, where the thiol part is simply the amino acid cysteine. So cysteine has a pendant thiol. So I can create and make various peptide sequences of interest and in incorporate cysteine into that. And then our PEG molecule, the key part, is finding an ene that will react very efficiently with this thiol. But when you mix these two together, they're very stable and don't undergo a side reaction, like a Michael addition that some of you might be familiar with. But these two instead, when you introduce light in the form of an, an initiator, undergo a thiolene step growth uh, reaction, and it's radical mediated, and form these hydrogel networks. So the idea is I can mix in different peptide components and different peg uh, sizes and molecular weights to create these hydrogels. And if you combine this, now we have all kinds of robotic techniques where I can deliver nanoliter quantities of these hydrogel precursors along with the cells of interest and I can screen through many different biomaterial formulations where I change the mechanical parts and properties of the hydrogel by the molecular weight of the peg or the number of linkers or arms it has. And then I change the biological signals by the peptides that I synthesize. And I can synthesize those depending upon the cells of interest that I'm working with and the signals that I would like to. And then I can look under a real-time microscope and track and watch those cells and screen for formulations that lead to a desired biological output. And I'll just show you one example here. Let's take those same cells that we looked at before in the PEG gels. And now if I put them in this formulation that has these peptide components where it has a degradable linker and a linker that the cells can attach to, now we're looking at a low magnification of those cells. So these are all the cells. And they're spreading. They're locally degrading this matrix and creating tracks through it. And I can screen for formulations where I have high degrees of motility. And I can screen for formulations that also prevent these cells from migrating through. They can bind to the material, but they can't move through it. And so one can now begin to think about designing matrices that one can put into wound sites that can recruit local cells that are important for wound healing while keeping out other cells that might be causing scarring or undesirable side effects. And so this was one uh, collaboration that involved an undergraduate student, a graduate student, and we had a medical fellow that came in that was from otolaryngology. Um, took me a while to be able to say that word. But these are basically surgeons that are interested in trying to treat craniofacial defects in your head um, and in the skull. So what we did was we created this critical size defect, a nine millimeter defect in a rat skull, and we tried to repair that. And when we put in our hydrogel, 
that the cells couldn't easily migrate through, we got very little healing, some around the ed edges here. But when we put in our hydrogel that served as a provisional matrix that could recruit some of those bone marrow cells, we could see large amounts of healing across this critical size gap. And so what was interesting and exciting about this is this is just material chemistry. We aren't delivering a, a drug or we aren't delivering cells even at this stage. We're just delivering a material to recruit local endogenous cells and influencing healing. So some of where this is now going is that I'll acknowledge, so that, right, this isn't completely healed. It takes nine weeks. And so this is where some of the synergies can be useful. So we can now learn about, do we need to have cells recruited to, uh, at a higher rate? So introduce chemotaxis or directed migration, or do we need to have more osteoinductive factors in this? Um, so that's where some of this research is going. Now I'd like to take a, a few minutes and also talk, though, about the other side of this. So on the one hand, we can add in lots of functionality, peptides and proteins and hydrogel formulations. But in many cases, it's also important to remove that signal or to be able to control not just the chemistry, but to control the mechanics of this. And so now I'd like to maybe put this in the context of one of the areas where we were really interested in not only how could we repair or regenerate tissues like bone and help them heal faster, but how could we regenerate tissue equivalents or understand um, how disease occurs and have disease models? Because if we could figure something out about disease, maybe we could find better ways to discover new drugs or ways to reverse disease where currently there aren't any drugs to do so. And so this is an a, a area that we've been working in for the past uh, five to seven years or so, where we've been interested in cardiac fibrosis, scarring of and stiffening of tissues in your heart, and one of those are your heart valves. So heart valve fibrosis. So here, here's a picture of um, a heart valve. Your heart has four valves. It directs flow within the chambers of your heart, coming in and out as well. Um, it has to open and close 60 to 80 times a minute. Many times it's directing blood flow. There's a huge pressure drop across this. Um, from an engineer's perspective, it's a perfect one-way valve <laughs> that's supposed to last our entire life. But this valve here, so th this is made up. It has these three leaflets that open and close with the beating of a heart. And these leaflets are about 300 microns thick, 3 to 400 microns thick. It's a very delicate tissue. And the cells that reside within that tissue are constantly undergoing an activation to go into repair mode when it's injured. And then once it's repaired and regenerated the leaflet, it goes back to a quiescent state. But sometimes that activation goes wrong. And it stays in this activated wound healing state. And when it's in that activated state, it's making tissue. It's depositing tissue. And what happens in that case is that all of a sudden you get a really thick leaflet. And when it gets really thick, it doesn't open and close very much. And your cardiovascular surgeon can see this happening and measure this, but they don't have good ways to reverse it or stop it. So we don't know what's going wrong, what's causing this activation or wound healing state. And you can see that in this picture here. If I take a thin section of this valve leaflet, and I, and I make it into a thin section and I stain it, I can put it under a microscope and look at the cells within this leaflet. And one of the things I can stain for is this protein called alpha smooth muscle actin in the red here. That is the activated, the wound healing valve cell. And in healthy tissues, you only have a small amount that are activated at any time. But in diseased tissues, you have lots of these activated cells called myofibroblasts. So we got interested. We wanted to understand what causes this activation. And if we could understand what causes this activation, could we design drugs to inhibit it and reverse this? So that was the, the challenge of the field. And we were interested in studying this. And we were collaborating with some molecular cell developmental biologists. And so we were set out. We had some ideas of what was causing this. And so uh, the student at the time was a, a 
biologists that we were jointly advising. And we would take these valve cells outside of that tissue and we were going to study them. And the classic way to study them is you put them on a tissue culture dish, which is made of polystyrene. And the thing about these valve cells is the minute you take them out of the tissue and you put that on that stiff polystyrene surface, they all become these activated cells that have this alpha smooth muscle actin. I'm going to call it a myofibroblast. And, and look at this little video. The minute you take it out of the tissue, they all become these myofibroblasts, these wound healing cells. They're making this protein. They're highly contractile. They s even snap together and form these nodules that will eventually even calcify in, in the in vitro tissue dish. So this could be a good model if you wanted to study disease progression in heart valve cells and cardiac tissue. But the problem was is that there is no way to study what are the cells really like in their quiescent state and could I study the process of them activating and then how they deactivate. So uh, this molecular biology student started collaborating with uh, material science and, and one of my chemical engineering PhD students and we were already doing work with these hydrogels. And so the first natural question is, well, is part of this because tissue culture polystyrene is a gigapascal in stiffness, six orders of magnitude higher than what a soft heart valve is. And so we put some of these cells into our hydrogel systems. And lo and behold, when we matched the gel mechanics and had cultured these cells in soft gels, we could begin to culture these cells like their quiescent fibroblast state in the native tissue and not like the activated myofibroblast and tissue culture polystyrene. And it resembles very closely when you look at a valve section, so very few activated cells. So that was our starting point. And then we got interested in, so if we can culture these cells in this quiescent state, now we can begin to ask questions. What's the role of how these cells sense that mechanical signaling? And is that really important in disease progression? And if I could figure out how they sense mechanical cues, could I inhibit that and use that as a, a target to try to reverse uh, heart fibrosis? So we could ask this hypothesis, but what we wanted now was we wanted a material system where we could not just control mechanics and control chemistry, but we wanted to dynamically change it. And so the student working on this was designing some materials where we could use light to break linkers inside of the gel. So here's our PEG molecule. And now we insert a, a, a chemical group, this nitrobenzyl ether, that when you expose it to light, it will undergo an intramolecular cleavage reaction. And so if I put this into my network and I connect up my hydrogel with these linkers that are light sensitive, then when I expose them to light, I can begin to start breaking down my hydrogel links, and that's going to influence the mechanical properties of the environment. And so we use, this is a rheometer that applies an oscillating stress to a hydrogel, and it's really sensitive to the links inside of this hydrogel material. And so when I expose to light, I'm going to change the mechanics, and I can in situ monitor that with this rheometer, where I measure the modulus, or somewhat the stiffness of the material, as a function of when I expose it. And I start out with a stiff material that I can then soften with exposure to light. And one can do this uh, using different wavelengths of light and intensity. But I think the interesting part is right here. So now I can have a cell-laden material. Watch those cells when they're in a quiescent state or an activated state and exposed to light and change the mechanical environment and watch how the cells respond. So I expose to light and shutter the light source, and now I have material that has half of that modulus. I've softened it. And then when I remove the light source, it's completely stable at that new steady state. And then I can re-expose again and watch how the cells respond. So we did that. So we put the cells in these types of environments, and we found regions where here the cells were still activated, but that if I softened it to here or to here, they would deactivate, and we could watch that deactivation in time. And we could quantify that, and we could ask questions. What happens when cells are in 
soft environments where they're deactivated and stiff? And can I go back and forth between these states by dynamic changes in the mechanical modulus? So why is this important? So our biology friends, when we do these types of experiments, they can look at all the intracellular pathways that are going up and down when you're making a material that's stiff or soft. And so I won't go into the details of this, but if one knows that entire network, then you can find certain nodes that are highly going up or down. And once we know that, we've been able to use that to design different types of hydrogel systems that can deliver inhibitors to those nodes. And now we can take heart cells that are normally activated, and if we treat them with those inhibitors, we can make them quiescent again. And so we're collaborating with clinicians at looking at different ways that we can deliver these molecules to targeted regions and tissues to try to inhibit and use it as a treatment to try to reverse these types of fibrotic disease. All right, so my time is uh, quickly running out. But what I'll tell you is just one small final example then is another way you can kind of think about this is we've designed systems that mimic the native extracellular matrix. And when we do experiments with that, we're being observers of cells. We're trying to design systems that match the in vivo environment in vitro and we can learn something. But then we also, with some of these light-triggered chemistries, we can be active experimenters. And I don't just have to passively observe. I can introduce chemistry and I can change the mechanical environment in situ and watch how cells respond to that. And that can be really useful when one is trying to understand and control very complex systems, such as many of the stem cells that one works with, or if you're culturing multiple different cell types. And this is where the photochemistry really is valuable because I can pattern in chemistry into regions of hydrogels by exposing through mass and controlling illumination of light. I can use two-photon confocal microscopy, not just for imaging my cells, but also for introducing chemistry. If I combine that thiolene reaction to add things in with the cleavage reaction to move, remove, I can create gradient structures and then cleave away certain regions of that gradient. Many times biology is about opposing gradients or waves of molecules. And so this is what we think about. We think of cell culture niches where we can expand and look at stem cells, add in chemistry and different signals at certain regions in time, sequentially add in a different signal at a different point in time, and then I can look for regions of where do I see proliferation that's high if I want to expand those cells. Or perhaps uh, not just high proliferation, but I look for regions where the cells are starting to become more like bone cells or osteogenic. And not only do I watch these cells, but if I use the photocleavable chemistry, I can capture cells in a certain region of interest and then gather those particular cells that I'd like and do further analysis or deliver them in, in vivo. And so with that, I think I'm just going to uh, skip to my summary. And um, I hope what I've shown you is there's lots of interesting ways that material chemistry and chemistry reactions are enabling the field in biomaterial science and, and biology and in clinical medicine to address really critical problems for our field. Um, dynamic environments are very important. I think they allow us to answer really interesting questions about how cells get signals from their environment and how they can be used to learn different ways to deliver molecules. And when you integrate these, you're able to design really complex culture systems that I think help serve as a bridge between traditional in vitro culture and in vivo experiments. And with that, um, certainly I'd like to acknowledge my group members. I think that's another thing about the Dreyfus Foundation, Dreyfus Foundation is that um, this truly isn't just about doing great science, but it's about the people that we get to train that do the, the great science. So everything that I showed you was effort of former and, and current uh, lab members. And I thank you all for your attention.
Oh, that was a really amazing talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering when you do these um, hydrogel experiments, how many cells, uh, the, in the images it looked like there were just one or two cells, but you were zooming in on small regions. But what sort of uh, number of cells are you using and how, what's the heterogeneity among the hydrogels? Yeah, so um, the cell density is something that can be controlled. We've gone as high as like 40 million cells uh, per milliliter or cubic centimeter, which is a pretty high density. Um, all the way down to something that's very low, like 250,000 cells in that same environment. So it kind of depends. Sometimes if you want a tissue model, you match the tissue. So cartilage is about 5 million cells. But if we really want to study cell matrix interactions, sometimes we make it really dilute so we don't have to worry about cell-cell communication, so we intentionally put the cells very far apart. But that's something you just control right when you're encapsulating the cell. What was the second part? Was, was that? Heterogeneity. Heterogeneity. So the hydrogels themselves, we haven't um, intentionally introduced much heterogeneity um, that on the size of a cell, which is like 10 microns, there's certainly heterogeneity and cross-linking density in, in chemistry on a molecular scale, but over a cell that integrates over all that, it's fairly homogeneous. Um, one could envision going with graded structures that are more reminiscent of, of tissues as well. A lot of tissue has hierarchical structure to that as you go across a bone or a piece of cartilage. Following up on the heterogeneity question, it, is the, uh, are the PEG hydrogel stiff enough that you could ablate microfluidic channels in them and actually run fluids through them uh, without having to introduce yet another material to channelize things? Yes, so we've done some of that with, um, with using two photon confocal microscopy. We create a monolithic hydrogel where one can go in and, and write channels or road features. Um, but it, cool. it, the high throughput of it isn't as, as nice as one might like, is the size of the, the focal plane and, and the two photon. Um, so yeah, you make smaller features and smaller devices. Very cool. Yeah. So I'd like to welcome everyone back from lunch and uh, please take your seats. It's my honor to introduce the uh, next speaker this afternoon, Marsha Lester from the University of Pennsylvania. Marsha was an undergraduate at Douglas College at Rutgers and er, earned her PhD in chemistry as a student of George Flynn at Columbia University. I met her there originally. She's now the Edmund J. Kahn Distinguished Professor in Department of Chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. She's the chief editor of the Journal of Chemical Physics. And she's a fellow of the Physical Society and the Chemical Society, has won numerous prizes. And um, her research in, is a rigorous study of chemical reactions, quite rigorous with novel spectroscopy and she studied a number of important intermediates in the environmental processes and this afternoon she'll be speaking to us about exploring uncharted regions of atmospheric chemistry reaction pathways. Marcia. Okay. 
Well, so as everybody has already commented, it's not easy to uh, follow that morning session. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to start by um, uh, with a bit of gratitude um, to the uh, Dreyfus program. I was a teacher scholar a long time ago, um, but I also want to acknowledge uh, the postdoctoral program in environmental chemistry. Uh, I've had the opportunity to have this award twice. Um, to, uh, to Craig Murray uh, um, initially held it um, and is now an assistant professor at UC Irvine. And uh, Joe Beams uh, um, in, is now a, a tenure-track faculty member at Cardiff University. And the uh, award in 2012 was really important because uh, that was actually the first funding of the project I'm going to tell you about today. So let's get started. <clears throat> um, I've had a fascination with the hydroxyl radical throughout most of my career. It's the most important uh, oxidant in the lower atmosphere. And um, it, it initiates the breakdown of most hydrocarbons, including methane, one of the most important greenhouse gases. And it also, um, uh, and most trace species that we emit into the atmosphere and, um, are broken down through their reaction with hydroxyl radicals. So I've studied it from the reactivity and the reactions that um, result from hydroxyl radicals. And the story I'm going to tell you today is about the formation of hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere because they constantly are being formed and removed and they're present in the atmosphere at a very low concentration, only in the order of 10 of the 6 molecules per cc, it's very, very low, um, in steady state. So we really want to care about, we really care about how they're formed. So uh, many of you may have um, uh, learned in, in introductory chemistry classes that the chemistry is all about the solar photolysis of, uh, of ozone that makes O singlet D, electronically excited oxygen atoms, uh, that can then react with water molecules to make two hydroxyl radicals. And in the classical atmospheric chemistry textbooks, that is the mechanism that you would read. Um, but it turns out that field studies, for example, this torch uh, study that was done in London area in the summer of 2003, have shown that that's actually only accounts for about a third of the hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere. And that there are other processes that are important. One is the solar photolysis of nitrous acid. And that comes about often um, in high NOx polluted environments. Um, but again, requires sunlight. So both of the uh, thirds, two thirds that are on the left hand side are solar driven chemistry. And uh, there's another third and that's this uh, on the right-hand corner here. And that's the reactions of alkenes, uh, uh, organic molecules with carbon-carbon double bonds that react with ozone to make hydroxyl radicals. And this does not require sunlight. Okay, so it's a uh, <clears throat> non-photolytic process. Some studies have even indicated that as much as 50% of the hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere in the summertime when there's, as you'll hear, large uh, biogenic alkene emissions and a lot of ozone uh, could be driven by this, uh, this, this last quarter, this uh, alkene ozonolysis reaction. So what I'm going to tell you today is that um, it sounds straightforward, <coughs> uh, but I'm going to tell you there's actually very, there's a lot of questions about this chemistry. Um, in fact, uh, uh, and, and that, that will be my story today of, of how that chemistry actually works from a physical chemist perspective, okay? Um, at nighttime, uh, this reaction also occurs. There's less hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere, but um, this is the chemistry that's also driving oxidation in the atmosphere. Okay, so many of you may be saying, why alkenes and why could they possibly be so important in the atmosphere? Well, it turns out that after methane, they're the most abundant organic species in the atmosphere. Again, alkenes are carbon-carbon double bonds. And, uh, and we all know that they're there. Um, uh, we're used to smell, the smell of, of, from pine trees. That's pinene, alpha pinene. Um, and that's part of the class of terpenes. Um, isoprenes make up uh, about a third of the uh, non-methane emissions. Um, and then there are, and they are coming primarily from plant emissions, plants and trees. Um, they also come about from biomass burning and fossil fuel emissions, and they tend to make smaller alkenes like ethene or propene or butadiene. And, um, and, and, uh, and so those are the systems we're going to be interested in studying. Okay. 
So let me tell you about the basic chemistry. Again, I know there's a lot of organic chemists here, so it's a little bit simplified version of this, of how it happens in the gas phase. So we're going to take your just typical car, uh, alkene, and it reacts with ozone. And the way it reacts is that ozone adds across the carbon-carbon double bond, and it makes what atmospheric chemists call a primary ozonide. And then uh, that primary ozonide splits apart in two parts. It breaks the, an OO bond and carbon-carbon bond simultaneously, and it releases two fragments, a stable uh, uh, carbonyl compound, uh, an aldehyde or a ketone, and also um, this uh, carbonyl oxide species, um, uh, this unusual zwitter ionic structure that I have illustrated here um, that are called Kriege intermediates. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about them in a moment. They're, they're initially formed highly energized. And uh, Rudolf Kriege did his work in the 1950s and proposed this reaction intermediate. And the bottom line is um, it wasn't observed for the first time until 2012. And I'm going to tell you about how we're observing it and why it's so important. Um, and, uh, um, and, and how it converts through um, what I will show you to be an intramolecular hydrogen transfer reaction that ends up releasing hydroxyl radicals. And moreover, the story is going to be that this process, even under thermal conditions in the atmosphere, happens by quantum mechanical tunneling. Okay? So hold those thoughts. So the things that I want to tell you about are how, do, how does this reaction occur? Um, it's, uh, uh, we're going to look at it. It depends strongly on the substituents, R1 and R2. Um, even simple changes in substituents from a hydrogen atom to a methyl or a larger system can, can change the chemistry dramatically and particularly affects the yield. And, uh, and all of the release of hydroxyl radicals is going to be in, co in competition with um, bimolecular reactions that are taking place in the atmosphere, water vapor, SO2, NO2, um, that are going on simultaneously. So, um, <clears throat> So uh, previous studies, you know, these kinds of systems have been studied for years and years in the atmosphere. In fact, they're even tabulated in IUPAC, um, the, what the yield is for, um, of OH from various alkene ozonolysis cell reactions. So if you start with ethene, the simplest uh, alkene, and um, have it undergo ozonolysis, the OH yield, the OH radical yield, is very low. But it increases dramatically as you go to two butenes uh, or if you go to um, uh, what we commonly call tetramethylethylene, where the yield of OH from uh, ozonolysis can be really quite large. So uh, I'll tell you more about the story of how we do these experiments later, but uh, we have been able to directly start from this reactive intermediate, these Kriege intermediates, and show that we get a very similar increase in yield of OH um, when we go to more, uh, when we go to substituted uh, intermediates with methyl groups or, or larger. Okay, so this is the atmospheric chemistry view of, of this kind of chemistry. Uh, we have alkene ozonolysis. We make what is uh, called the Kriege intermediate. Um, it can undergo, uh, it's, it's formed initially energized. There's about 50 kcal per mole of excess energy. And um, it, it's released, uh, some of it's released promptly. And so there's OH formed uh, immediately. And then uh, in the atmosphere, it's at atmospheric pressure, of course. There's collisional stabilization. And atmospheric chemists have uh, hypothesized that there would be a stabilized Kriege intermediate present in the atmosphere as well. And then that stabilized intermediate could go on in these bimolecular reactions, for, and it would act as an oxidant in and of itself. For example, oxidizing SO2 to SO3 and then eventually uh, sulfuric acid, um, reacting with NO2 in a similar way, and, and water vapor. I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Um, but very important in all of this is that these reactions are thought to be um, in the initiators for uh, the nucleation steps, the initiators for formation of secondary organic aerosols. And aerosols are, um, uh, are of course, uh, worrisome from a human health perspective, um, but they're also very important in climate change. And so here is chemistry starting from this reactive intermediate that is impacting in the atmosphere. Okay, and then on the other side, um, uh, this uh, now stabilized intermediate can undergo a thermal uh, decay process and again release hydroxyl radicals. 
So what I'll be telling you about today are, um, well, first, how do you uh, isolate or make or stabilize these intermediates if they're so important? Uh, how can you sensitively detect them? And then I'm really going to focus on how they rearrange uh, to release hydroxyl radicals, which are so important uh, in the atmosphere. Um, what we'll do is we'll look at it uh, in an energy-dependent way, um, uh, giving the system specific amounts of energy and measuring the rate at which hydroxyl radicals are released. And we'll also extrapolate to under thermal conditions. And as I said already once, but I'll repeat again, um, uh, this process involves quantum mechanical tunneling of the hydrogen atom in the hydrogen atom transfer process. Okay, so why has it been that this reactive inter this class of reactive intermediates has been hypothesized to be so important but never observed? And uh, this is illustrated here for the simplest uh, system, ethene plus ozone. Um, it reacts actually rather slowly. It makes in various types of intermediates. The Kriege intermediate, this vitter ion that I'm going to be telling you about, could also make dioxirane, a ring-like system. It could also have a dioxymethylene-type uh, structure. Uh, and, and all of those are isomers. They all uh, have the same mass, different uh, configurations. Um, and then they're consumed rap rapidly, either by rearrangement, for example, as I have illustrated here, to make uh, formic acid, or alternatively, um, they, uh, uh, and formic acid has, again, an isomer, the same mass, but now a stable product. Um, it falls apart to make other species, and it can also be consumed by bimolecular reactions with the reactants themselves, with the products, with other atmospheric species, or if you do this in solution, of course, with the solvent. So all of those places. And the bottom line is they had never been observed. Okay, so what happened? In 2012, um, uh, there was a beautiful, uh, there was a, a, a new way of generating these reactive intermediates. And it's totally different chemistry, but it makes the desired intermediate that it gives us a starting point for investigating the chemistry. And the, it's, it's sort of simple, but it was unexpected, I think. If you start with diiodoalkanes and you photolyze them, we do this in the UV at 248 nanometers, it, uh, it releases, uh, it breaks a carbon iodine bond and it makes uh, um, an iodoalkyl radical. And then that radical reacts with O2 molecular oxygen and the uh, oxygen replaces the iodine and makes the Kriege intermediate. Well, how do you know? There's all these different isomeric forms. Uh, um, they all have the same mass. How do you know you have it? And, and so uh, this uh, chemistry was, uh, initiate, was uh, first done by um, uh, Craig Tages and co-workers at Sandia National Laboratory. And they used the advanced light source at Berkeley to have tunable vacuum ultraviolet light. And they measured the threshold for ionization of these species, which was lower than of the stable uh, isomeric forms. Um, and so um, I, I guess as a nice story, I guess we could probably all share this. This, you know, reading this paper for the first time was highly motivating to me. And I immediately said, oh, we could do this in our laboratory, and I think there are other ways of detecting these systems besides photoionization. And uh, we, uh, so we, we started generating them in our lab, and so far we've made uh, four different systems, the simplest, met one methyl, two methyl substituent, and an ethyl substituent, um, uh, and there's uh, uh, by this same uh, approach. I, I do want to emphasize that the chemistry changes a lot with substituent, and I'll, I'll touch on that, um, and, and we can come back to that perhaps in the questions or in future challenges. So what I realized and I wanted to investigate was that um, this um, uh, carbonyl oxide group actually has an extended pi system, and I wanted to um, look for um, a, uh, the, a very strong, what was predicted to be a very, very strong pi to pi star transition in these molecules. So I'm illustrating this here. Um, there were uh, uh, theoretical calculations um, that I'm showing the molecular orbitals for indicated that there were four electrons in a, um, in a pi system that's localized in this carbonyl oxide group. And uh, there was predicted to be a very, very strong pi to pi star transition from bonding to antibonding um, excitation. 
uh, that would be similar uh, to what had been, what's known um, uh, in ozone, and, uh, I, which is isoelectronic. And so we went after trying to identify this uh, very strong UV transition. So um, uh, these, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but basically um, what we did was uh, uh, simultaneous um, ionization uh, monitoring, this is for the CH2OO, or ionizing using fixed frequency vacuum ultraviolet light in our laboratory. But then what we did is we introduced an ultraviolet laser tunable um, that would promote molecules from their ground state to an excited electronic state. And each time that UV transition was resonant, it would remove molecules from the ground state and therefore cause a depletion in our ionization signal. So you can see that on the right here. Here's the ionization signal. Here's the depleted ionization when we have UV light on. And here's the difference. And by using this technique, we could map out at different UV wavelengths the um, a depletion spectrum, which is exactly equivalent to the absorption spectrum of this, of these Kriege intermediates. Um, and this was really, this is really important because uh, this approach is now used for uh, making, the, making measurements of the bimolecular reactions of these reactive intermediates with all sorts of other species because there's a sensitive probe. And we extended that probe uh, to all, throughout all the systems, and we found that the absorption spectrum shifted a little bit, um, uh, about 20 nanometers to shorter wavelength when we did alkyl substitution, and I'd be happy to, um, to discuss that. So let me get back to my main story for today. We really want to understand how alkene ozonolysis uh, releases hydroxyl radicals, and this is sort of the origin of my of the title for my talk. I'm interested in understanding um, uh, the reaction profile, the minima, the maximum, and how uh, molecules move along this reaction coordinate to release hydroxyl radicals. So the uh, the figure that I have shown here is for the entire uh, alkene ozonolysis reaction. There's a small barrier to get it going, but then it basically releases an enormous amount of energy um, as it uh, uh, goes through this uh, first primary ozonide and then releases the, the Kriege intermediate. So it's so much better if we want to understand the mechanism if we can start directly from the reactive intermediate and, and follow the pathway out. And in particular, we're very interested in trying to determine the barrier associated with um, uh, the rearrangement, the uh, intramolecular hydrogen transfer reaction that ultimately releases hydroxyl radicals. So uh, the way the mechanism works is um, if you have a, a methyl or an alkyl substituent, um, a, a hydrogen in, uh, will transfer, uh, an alpha hydrogen will transfer from, in this case, the methyl group to the terminal oxygen that costs energy. We take energy to get up over a barrier to cause that hydrogen transfer to occur. Um, and that uh, therefore uh, creates a, a, a new species, this vinyl hydroperoxide after the uh, hydrogen transfers. It has a lot of excess energy, the OO bond, weak OO bond breaks and it releases hydroxyl radicals. So uh, for the rest of my talk, I'll just explain how we have been investigating this reaction coordinate. Um, what's the barrier? What's the rate of reaction? Um, and how does all of that change with substituents? Um, so this is the way the uh, experiment works in my lab. Um, there were already theoretical calculations that uh, uh, identified um, uh, the barrier associated with the reaction I just described. So let's take a look at that uh, transition state. Um, this is the transition state for hydrogen transfer from the methyl group to the terminal oxygen. You can see the hydrogen being shared between the methyl um, and terminal oxygen. And uh, what we wanted to do was to uh, provide enough energy to the system to uh, drive this chemical reaction. So uh, we initially started thinking that, th th this is all theoretical here, we were initially thinking um, that it would require two quanta of CH stretch in order to put in enough energy to surmount, or as I will show you, tunnel through that barrier. 
um, for the general audience here, tunneling, I guess I should just emphasize, tunneling means you're not going over the mountain, you're going through the mountain, okay? And it only works for light particles like electrons or protons or hydrogen atoms, which is the case here. Okay, so um, our experiments then are going to uh, involve uh, vibrationally activating this molecule. Uh, one quantum of CH stretch is not going to provide enough energy, well, enough energy to, to surmount. Um, two quanta should take us right in the right region. And uh, what we want to do is uh, scan our infrared laser. This is a, um, a tunable uh, optical parametric oscillator that, um, and, and we're going to then, um, uh, basically as we tune, uh, drive this reaction and we're going to detect the hydroxyl radicals that are formed. Okay, so um, this was very, very exciting result. I don't know, it's the spectrum. Maybe it won't be so exciting to you, but really exciting result. Um, uh, what we were able to show was that um, by putting in, there are four different types of CH stretches in this molecule. Um, they're color-coded here and they're color-coded in the calculated spectrum. And we, what we would do is put in two quanta in any one of those modes or one quantum in each of two modes. Those are called combination bands. And we expected to see 10 spectroscopic features in this region. And when we scanned our infrared laser and detected OH products, um, you can see that we generated a spectrum or a fingerprint uh, of telling us that we were, um, uh, that we were exciting this molecule and it was uh, recording out its infrared spectrum. But this is more exciting than just, you know, putting your, uh, just an FTIR spectrum. Um, it's because uh, each one of these vibrations is driving reaction and we're detecting products. We're detecting the OH products that result. The part that was particularly surprising is that we were seeing features at significantly lower energy than we expected based on the theoretical calculations. We expected the barrier to be about here, and I'll show you in a moment that that's where actually it is. And we're seeing features uh, con to considerably lower energy, and, and even I'll show you in a moment, we can go to much lower energies and, this, and, this spectra, and still obtain spectra. So uh, what's going on? Well, there's two possibilities. Look, either theory cannot calculate barriers very well. That's one possibility. I won't show, I won't, you didn't hear me say that, okay? Uh, okay. Or, or maybe, or the, the result is that, um, uh, or tunneling is occurring, quantum mechanical tunneling, and we're going through the barriers. So um, these are calculations. Um, so this is uh, our experimental spectrum uh, for the methyl and the dimethyl substitute to Kriege in both cases. Uh, two quanta of CH stretch being put in. And uh, the dashed lines indicate the best theoretical calculations to date of uh, the barrier. And this takes into account zero point energy. It's very fancy calculations, better than I can do, I assure you. <laughs> really excellent calculations. And so what you can see is that many of the spectroscopic features in this region, the infrared transitions, are at lower energy than the barrier, indicating um, that we must be tunneling. Okay, so, so we went from there and we said, okay, that's great. Um, uh, maybe we can measure the rate of this process. What is the, um, what is the rate at which we're forming uh, hydroxyl radicals? And we've done it so far for three systems, the methyl, dimethyl, and ethyl uh, substituted Kriege intermediates in this, uh, in this same uh, spectral region. So this is what the data looks like. Um, uh, again, uh, so color-coded, so you can follow, um, they're me we're, we're measuring um, the appearance of OH products. It's happening on a nanosecond time scale, and it's happening with different rates for different substituents, okay? And, um, and uh, we're exciting at a, a very similar energy. So there's a couple of reasons this could happen. They have different barriers, so that could affect the rate. Um, the other things that are going on is that there are, um, uh, the substituents are changing uh, the properties of the molecule. So for example, you add an extra methyl groove, you now have a low frequency methyl rotor. So you're changing the density of states and that affects the, the rate of dissociation. You add a, in the ethyl group, similarly, you add an alkyl uh, side chain, so you have low frequency torsional motions. And again, this can have an influence on the rate of reaction. Okay, so um, 
so I'm just going to give you a snapshot of the way we're thinking about things right now um, and uh, tell you uh, why I think this is really cool. So uh, we can um, excite at different uh, energies. They correspond to different infrared uh, transitions of this molecule. And this is our experimental data for the methyl uh, substituted Kriege. And, and what you can see is that the um, uh, rate uh, increases or the lifetime uh, decreases as we go up in energy. Um, and at about, this, about a year ago, uh, uh, we were uh, uh, collaborating, we are collaborating with Stephen Klippenstein at Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, he and our, simultaneously, his group and our group were uh, calculating from first principles the rate of this reaction. And the line I've just superimposed on our experimental data is the first principles theoretical calculation of this rate. There are no adjustable parameters. This is not a fit to the data. This is pure theory. And what it tells us is, it's a, it tells us that we know very well what this barrier is and that we can predict the rate in a statistical fashion for this unimolecular rearrangement process. And I should need to emphasize that the calculations are done assuming tunneling. So uh, we uh, you know, got it right once. Let's do it again. Um, this is what the data looks like um, in the next system. Again, theory is precisely, uh, we can precisely calculate um, the rate of this reaction uh, based on, these, on the barrier. And, um, and this is validating the barrier height. So what's the influence of tunneling? And, and uh, this is uh, the part of the story that I want to emphasize. Theory can turn on or off tunneling. And so it's useful to think about or look at how different the rate would be, the rate of reaction would be um, in the absence of this uh, of, of tunneling. And, um, uh, and you can see that it, it, it's considerably um, uh, slower and doesn't even occur at, at many of the energies we investigate. And so I just emphasize that um, the tunneling is coming about from this hydrogen transfer process, which is going through the barrier rather than over the barrier. So most recently, we've gone a lot lower in energy. And uh, just to illustrate how important tunneling is in this system, and um, it'll take us into the thermal rates that I want to discuss next. So we went about 2,000 wave numbers below the, the barrier. Now we're exciting a CH stretch in combination with some other lower frequency mode. And again, you can scan the, um, the excitation, the IR laser, and um, be detecting products. And you can see that we, we observe um, many different, several different um, IR transitions associated with this molecule. Um, and, uh, and then we go and look at the rate. And uh, when we were up higher in energy, that rate was about um, a few nanoseconds. And now it's hundreds of nanoseconds. It's 100 times slower because it's that much harder to tunnel through the barrier at much lower energies. OK, so um, as an atmosphere, so we're now taking all the things we've learned from physical chemistry and now going to apply it to atmospheric chemistry. Atmospheric chemistry cares about the thermal rate and so uh, we wanted to then model, based on what we've learned from the um, energy-specific excitation and driving of this uh, unimolecular decay process, we now have a very good determination of the barrier. We know tunneling is very important. And uh, we're going to uh, consider what happens in the atmosphere when, um, when you have collisions at 10 to the 10th per second, which corresponds to every tenth of a nanosecond you have a collision. So uh, we can now model you, uh, the, the thermal process just basically by looking, having a Boltzmann weighted uh, distribution of the kinds of rates that I've shown you. And we can predict a thermal rate um, uh, which is given here. But the key part is it's, it's much, much slower, six orders of magnitude slower than, than what we were measuring, than what we've measured at, high, at, at higher energy. And uh, it's so slow that it's actually very hard to measure because bimolecular reactions are happening simultaneously. And it's very, very hard to get um, a clean measurement of this. But nevertheless, uh, and, and there's another possible channel, I should indicate, that there's another intermediate along the path. And it's possible there could be trapping there as well. We don't know yet. 
So there have now been, um, uh, since our measurement, our experiments and, and theoretical predictions, there's now been uh, uh, two uh, experimental uh, measurements of this thermal rate for the dimethyl substituted Kriege, and you can see it, it, it agrees quite well. Well, when you can combine experiment and theory, you can uh, not just measure it at one temperature, you can basically look at the thermal rate over all the temperatures that are relevant in the atmosphere and beyond. And, and so here I, I, this is all modeling based on our experimental data. Um, and I, I, I want to emphasize this is just something that we've all learned in freshman chemistry. This is an Arrhenius plot. The log of the rate constant is a function of one over te temperature, okay? Um, and, and these are our predicted rates as a function of temperature. And uh, what's, uh, you can see that we can predict, of course, the rate at room temperature uh, for these different systems. It varies a little bit because the barrier heights are a little different, uh, calculated barrier heights are a little bit different. But the part that I want to uh, emphasize is um, it's supposed to be a straight line, right? That's what we teach everybody. And the, the slope of that line is the, activation bar is the activation energy. Well, it's not. It's curved. And that curvature is a signature of tunneling, even under the thermal rate. OK. So um, how important is this uh, unimolecular process, the releasing hydroxyl radicals? It's an important source of hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere, but it's in competition with uh, bimolecular processes in the atmosphere. And the most important bimolecular process or process wi is with water vapor, okay? And uh, uh, experiments and theory done in other groups, including with Joe Francisco, who's here with us today, have indicated that um, for the simplest Kriege intermediate, this cannot undergo the mechanism I've been describing uh, for, that occurs for the methyl substituted ones. Uh, the most important reaction with, in bimolecular reaction happens to be with water dimer. I think this is really quite surprising. At 70% relative humidity, this is 100 t it's 10 times faster than the rates that I was describing. Um, it was published by two groups in the last year. Joe Francisco and colleagues have just shown that, and this was uh, just appearing, that um, the simplest Kriege intermediate actually also reacts on water droplets, so clouds, or clouds uh, and even faster by two different mechanisms, uh, a, a simultaneously hydrogen transfer, hydrogen transfer reaction with the monomer, dimer, or trimer of water, but also uh, in a different, completely different mechanism uh, that involves proton transfer. For the methyl and dimethyl substituted and alkyl substituted systems, it seems that the um, uh, loss is primarily due to this uh, intramolecular hydrogen transfer process that releases hydroxyl radicals, and it's faster than bimolecular reactions in these cases. Okay, so I'm close to wrapping up. Uh, this is the picture of the atmospheric chemistry um, uh, that I've come back to. Um, what I've shown you today is that um, we've learned how to generate these uh, reactive intermediates in the laboratory. We can measure the rates of um, unimolecular decay, and we can compare, we can uh, predict the thermal rates, and we can compare them with um, bimolecular processes with other species in the atmosphere. But before I leave you, I want to show you, I want to bring it all the way back to the atmosphere. Um, and this is, uh, so uh, atmospheric chemists, and this is done by uh, Dylan Millay, who's at the University of Minnesota, can run global models uh, to try to understand the chemistry. And uh, what, what we're plotting here is the uh, relative amount of hydroxyl radicals coming from the Kriege mechanism that I've been describing relative to the conventional mechanism, if you will, the solar-driven photolysis that, that leads to uh, Osingla D plus, plus water vapor. When it's red, um, that means that 40% um, you know, of the reaction is coming from these uh, Kriege intermediates. And uh, so that's a, the, this reaction does not require sunlight. So of course, in the winter time, the northern hemisphere is uh, dark more of the time. And so the uh, Kriege mechanism that I've been describing is, is quite important. You can see that it's also very important in, in regions with um, 
uh, tropical forest regions where there's high alkene emissions. And of course, everything flips um, when, it's the, when it's the summertime. And uh, um, although uh, the tropical forests and um, biogenic alkene emissions are very, very important in generating um, hydroxyl radicals. OK, so um, this is a brief summary of, of, of what I've said. But, um, but I also want to, I, I think I just want to focus for a moment on the future challenges. Um, uh, uh, I think it's important to think about what next and what, what is still, what is missing. We've made a lot of progress, but we certainly don't know all the answers. And, and one of the things that's really important is that um, biogenic systems, um, the uh, alpha pinenes, the terpenes, uh, we know nothing about their reactive intermediates. They have um, much more complicated side chains. Their chemistry is going to be different. Um, and then another really important area for investigation is the initial stage, stages of nucleation and growth of aerosol products um, in this chemistry. So I think these are important challenges to be thinking about. And, uh, and I guess I just want to say that um, I want to thank um, the Dreyfus Foundation and um, many other groups that, uh, and other agencies that support our work and the team of scientists in my group that have done it all. So thank you very much. Oh, hi. Uh, so in your comparison with um, RLKM theory with tunneling, uh, the agreement is pretty remarkable. But still, I see that um, there are the theory tends to underestimate the experiment a little bit. Do you know where that comes from? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I didn't go into the details about this. but. Um, so, so far, we've been modeling uh, the tunneling as a one-dimensional problem. And in fact, we've been using two different models. One is um, the simplest possible one. It's called an Eckhart. Uh, it's like an inverted parabola. Um, and the other is uh, we also have been using um, Bill Miller's semi-classical transition state theory. But all of those methods are one-dimensional. Um, and so uh, one possibility uh, is that there's coupling between the reaction coordinate and other degrees of freedom. Um, the other issue is that the density of states is just very, very low. And, um, and, uh, we're, and so the, the number of states is rather sparse. And we think that also may be contributing. But all of these are important theoretical questions that we haven't yet explored. So, um, but it's certainly on our mind. And we are seeing deviations. <coughs> So that was a very nice presentation. Uh, you know, there's this abiding problem that observed OH in the troposphere is considerably <laughs> higher than, than calculated. Yeah. So you've contributed slightly to the solution of that on, on this <laughs> diagram. What's your judgment about the fundamental quality of the OH measurements? In the atmosphere? Yes. Uh, well, you know better than I, but, um, but I, I think um, there is controversy about the, about the uh, measures, measurements themselves. I think um, some of the things that I'm following up on, um, uh, the chemistry involving in pristine environments, uh, this is making big news, I'm sure you're aware of it, um, in pristine uh, 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 forested areas, um, possible new sources or, uh, or uh, uh, yeah, basically, more OH out than went into the chemistry uh, is, uh, uh, is, are really important questions. And I think that the, um, what do I think? I think there's potential problems in measurement, but I think there are actually big unknowns in the sci underlying science. So uh, what, what do you think here? <laughs> you need to comment briefly. Uh, we don't have time to okay. go away, I think. <laughs> That's one way of getting off of it. <laughs> No, 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 it's a great question. Okay, so, so um, of course, if you want to, um, uh, you know, I've tried to convince you that this is a hydrogen transfer reaction, and of course, you'll slow it down if you deuterate. Um, it just, uh, let me at least explain why it's a hard experiment that we're working on still, okay? Um, 
so the way we've been injecting energy into the system is through CH stretches. So as soon as we go to CD stretches, the vibrational frequency drops a lot. So two quanta of CD stretch uh, takes us at about the same low energy as I had been showing in, in one of my slides. And, and so, the, uh, so we uh, have the problem of getting the energy into the system because uh, due to CD stretches are so much lower in frequency. And we predict, but we haven't yet measured, um, that it to be, uh, I think it's like 50 times slower still at, at a comparable energy. Um, we've deuterated, we've made the precursors. Actually, for those of you who know me, um, we're actually synthesizing molecules, okay? So uh, we've, we've, deuter we've created the deuterated systems and we're trying. Okay, so that's, that's a, another great question. It turns out that um, uh, uh, you basic, basically you get local uh, oscillators. Uh, they're so different in frequency that we can predict theoretically that they, they don't really communicate with one another. They're such different in frequency. But that's a possibility. Yeah. Mixed, mixed isotopes, yeah. Bishop. Anthony is a professor in the Department of Chemistry and the program in Biochemistry and Biophysics at Amherst College. He holds degrees from UCSD in Princeton and began his career at Amherst in 2003 after completing postdoctoral work at the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, it seems like a persistent uh, theme of many of the Dreyfus teacher scholars is work is, is uh, taking an interdisciplinary approach to their research. And Anthony is no uh, exception. His lab at Amherst takes uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study of cell signaling processes, combining chemical and biochemical approaches. Today he's going to talk with us about small molecule on-off switches for signaling enzymes target specific inhibition and activation of protein tyrosine phosphatases. Please welcome Anthony Bishop. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I, of course, want to echo the other speakers in thanking the Dreyfus Foundation, Foundation for all the support through the years. Uh, and I, I just want to put my thanks in a little different light, specifically for those of you who aren't familiar with Amherst College. It's an exclusively undergraduate institution. Uh, and the Dreyfus Foundation has a just superb record of supporting research at undergraduate research institutions. And I've met many colleagues here today, uh, this, today and yesterday doing fantastic work primarily with undergrads. So it's really a credit to the foundation that they uh, both recognize the importance of and support strongly uh, the cutting edge science that can come out of, uh, out of primarily undergraduate research institutions. Thank you, Tom, for getting through this title. <sighs> At today's uh, talk on scientific communication, I realized I had the most wordy, jargon-filled uh, title. So some quick, some quick editing. There we go. Chemical on-off switches for cellular enzymes. So what I'm going to talk about today is a chemical means to turn on the activity or turn off the activity of selected members of one of the largest family uh, of signaling enzymes uh, in human biology. So we're at a place where we've actually been for quite a while now in our understanding of cellular biochemistry, and that is uh, using a gross oversimplification. We pretty much know the genome sequence and we're pretty good at guessing the proteins that would be encoded from the, that genome sequence of just about any of us and just about any model organisms that we'd care uh, to work on. So again, oversimplification, but let's call that 
a solved problem. The roadblock, however, in, comes in translating sequence to function. And, of course, again, a vast oversimplification to say unknown. You know, there are many proteins that have been studied uh, in great detail, and we know a lot about them. And you, the biochemists out there might say, from sequence, can't we know something, whether, know whether it's a kinase or a phosphatase or a G-protein coupled receptor or a protease? And yes, of course we can. So I'm talking about function in a much broader form, not biochemical function so much as biological function. Even if we can know something as a kinase or a phosphatase or a protease, we can't know simply from a sequence what signaling pathways it functions in, when its activity is important in those signaling pathways, when misregulation of its activity is, leads to aberrant signaling and therefore possibly pathogenesis. And so this is the roadblock, getting from here to there. So how do we get around the roadblock? Well, before we talk as chemists, we've got to give molecular biologists their, their due. Biologists have developed a many of powerful tools, a whole suite of tools for bridging this gap, which mostly take advantage of complementarity of DNA sequences. Right? So you can knock out a particular gene you want, or you can put in a particular gene you want. You can knock down the expression of the particular gene you want. And like any complex system, a nice way to interrogate something as complex as a cell is to take out one part and see what happens, or put in one thing and see what happens. And these tools, you can't really open up science or nature or even the New York Times without reading about applications of these tools these days. And they're so powerful because they're so specific. They, they rely on DNA, DNA interactions and the complementarity of DNA, or I should say more broadly nucleic acid uh, interactions. And so they're highly specific. If you knock out a gene, you know you're knocking out that one. If you put in a gene into a model organism, you know you're putting in that one. So what are the complications? Well, the complications is that they generally act slowly. So when we're talking about genetic perturbations, we're talking about perturbations that act at the gene level, not at the level of the functional molecule, the protein. Generally in signaling, it's the protein that's the functional, functional molecule. Often require complex delivery systems. Nucleic acids don't freely pass through cell membranes. And so again, a lot of clever people have come up with a lot of great but often complex ways to, to get these tools into cells. And they generally are binary. That is, we knock out a gene or we put in a gene. There's a, not a tunability there in being able to, to investigate, oh, let's say 50% of a particular enzyme of interest fun, uh, activity or 75%, uh, so on and so forth. So does the world need chemists? If all those biological tools are so powerful, we could imagine, well, we, small molecules doing very similar things. If we had small molecules that could turn off or turn on the activity of particular proteins, we could use those to probe function. And when I list the pros of small molecules, it's going to look very familiar. It really is just the last slide, the complications of genetic approach is now flipped over into pros. Generally, small molecules act rapidly within seconds to minutes, the same sort of time frames that signaling events take place within a cell. They're often reversible. We can often add them and, and or wash them away. They generally don't require complex delivery systems, and they're completely tunable. You can add 100 nanomole or 200 nanomole or 300 nanomole and probe dose-dependent uh, responses. The complication, we're again flipping the last slide on its head, lack of specificity. You put a small molecule into a cell or into an organism, hmm, do you know what it's doing? Maybe, maybe you have a good guess, but at best is a good guess. You never know all the other binding partners that may be affected by that small molecule. And so, in short, small molecules are everything that are good and everything that are bad about drugs. They're handy, we can use them quickly, we can dose them, but often they come with side effects. So the central challenge for, that motivates a lot of the, the research in my lab is, can we identify small, small molecules or use small molecules uh, in novel ways that approach the specificity uh, of genetic mutations? Uh, and I've stolen this figure from a review by Stuart Schreiber, but just to bring up, just to sort of summarize everything I've said to date, we can imagine, <coughs> imagine inactivating mutations in a gene C that encodes protein C. We can envision activating mutations that uh, encode an activated form uh, of C. 
Conversely, we're going to imagine a small molecule that blocks the uh, activity of C or a small molecule that activates protein C in this signaling pathway shown. And these question marks are really for the two activating ones. We'll let's file that away for now, but actually it's not clear how you would just make a mutation and activate a particular gene of interest. For most proteins, activating mutations are not readily knowable. And it's really not obvious how you would imagine a small molecule activating some protein C. Usually, the most intuitive way to think about a small molecule acting on a protein is, say, binding at the active site uh, and inhibiting it. So again, file this away. It's going to be a few minutes before we talk about activation. Uh, but there are very few ways for chemically turning on protein function. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to describe one today. So how do you go about finding highly selective small molecules? This gray didn't come out very well, but that's grayed out. But, the, but there's a whole big industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry, that tries to do exactly this, right? find small molecules that act with high specificity. And to do so, generally, you try to take advantage of some tiny molecular difference in your target of interest versus all the other targets uh, that your small molecule may, may bind to. We're going to come back to this uh, later in the talk because the work I'm going to spend most of the talk on really has circled back to a more medicinal uh, approach. But for now, let's think about a different tack. In this different tack, we're going to allow ourselves to cheat, if you will, in devising a very specific ligand for a protein target. And by cheating, I mean not just finding something that fits in that active site but doesn't fit in the active sites of related proteins, but to actually engineer the protein in such a way that it binds some ligand. And when that ligand binds, it either inhibits or activates the protein of interest. Now, I have an assertion here that this is particularly useful for large conserved gene families. And not clear why that is, so let me just say why that is. Imagine this protein is a member of a large protein family. So there's not only protein A, but there are B, C, D, E, F, and G all the way through to Z, if you like, that are highly homologous, that share very similar structure then it would be very difficult to find an active site, say, inhibitor, that bound protein A specifically. Whereas if you use molecular engineering to make some difference in A that's unique to A, doesn't exist in B through Z, then we would be able to, say, inhibit it or activate it. And the key potential payoff is what we learned on engineering protein A, we could potentially apply to then other proteins in the family. If we take advantage of some conserved part of that large protein family, make some molecular switch, express that in our cell type of interest, then we could presumably apply that beyond the prototype protein to other members uh, of a family. So we need a protein family to talk about. And there are a number of big, important protein families in cell signaling. And the one that's going to command our attention today uh, is the protein tyrosine phosphatases, or PTPs. These are enzymes which hydrolytically remove phosphate from phosphotyrosine. And you can just think of phosphate as nature's on-off switch right, for cell signaling. When a residue, an amino acid residue, is phosphorylated, it changes, of course, its structure as well as its charge distribution, and everything you could imagine wanting to be changed in a signaling pathway. Cellular localization, enzymatic activity on-off, Membrane association on off, nucleic acid association on off, all of that can be controlled by the addition of a phosphate. So of course then the interplay between kinase activity and phosphatase activity is, is central to essentially regulating everything uh, in mammalian signaling. And there are a bunch of these enzymes, roughly 250 that put phosphate on, roughly 100 that take phosphate off. So biochemically these enzymes are kind of boring. They all do a pretty simple reaction, hydrolysis of phosphotyrosine to tyrosine, but biologically there's nothing boring about them. It's, it comes with the signaling field that there are going to be a whole bunch of horrible acronyms in this talk. These are just all different PTPs. And they're all those Pac-Mans right, from the previous oversimplified cartoons. They're all proteins which share a conserved domain, a little bit more on that uh, on the next slide. But as you can see, all any sort of biological application that you'd want to study, growth factor signaling, uh, SARC kinase activation in cancer, immune response, cell adhesion, actin cytoskeleton, as to sort of bolster my assertion that 
phosphate-mediated uh, phosphorylation, phosphatase-mediated phosphorylation uh, controls everything in biology. Uh, that's just a smattering to, to show that's true. Okay, so what do PTPs have in common and how do they differ? Here is a slide taken from a review of a bunch of different PTPs, and you can see what they share is this blue circle. So that blue circle is a PTP domain. That confers the catalytic activity, the phosphatase activity, on the protein. You can see outside of that blue circle, they don't share anything. They can have appended domains that localize them to the membrane, that inter <coughs> undergo other protein-protein interactions, all of those other domains are critical for the particular cellular localization and the particular substrate specificity of one of these protein tyrosine phosphatases. But these are all expressed in completely different cell types, have completely different signaling pathway roles. All they share is, again, that off, on-off switch is mediated through a PTP domain. So, again, for our purposes, these blue circles are just those nice orange Pac-Men we saw earlier. So the approach is, could we engineer a PTP such as uniquely can be act acted upon by a target-specific ligand, express that target in a cell, and have target-specific PTP inhibition, even in a milieu of other uh, unengineered phosphatases that look very similar, again, except for the modification. And as promised, we're going to look at both inhibition and activation. We can use the same cartoon for both at this point. There would be a different change, of course, that would render it inhibitable versus activatable, but conceptually highly similar. So what's wrong with these pictures? Well, they're just, they're grossly oversimplified, and they don't, they don't appear to be possible. Right? How would making some notch up there render the protein sensitive to inhibitor uh, or an activator? In fact, few inhibition, allosteric inhibition sites and activation sites are just not known on PTPs, uh, and so we've had to do a good bit of engineering to figure out uh, how to do this. But what we wanted was we wanted a ligand which had no inherent affinity for a PTP, but that we could, with a minimal amount of engineering, make some change in a critical, say, loop or structural element in that PTP such that affinity to the ligand was conferred, and then binding of that ligand would modulate the activity. So we went to the literature and asked, you know, what ligands, small molecule ligands are out there that you could engineer in affinity with a relatively small amount of protein engineering. And we've done a lot of work with these biarsenical compounds that were originally developed in Roger Chen's lab at UCSD. <laughs> the prototypical one is shown here. It's called FLASH. FLASH binds uniquely to cysteine-rich motifs, canonically a tetracysteine motif, but in data I'll show you today, we can uh, bind specifically to as few as three cysteines, which is helpful for minimizing the engineering we have to do to our target protein. But FLASH was developed as a cell visual, as, excuse me, as a protein visualization tool, but we're asking, can we use it, can we direct it to a cysteine-rich motif that's engineered to control protein activity? And since FLASH was reported, a number of other biarsenical compounds have been reported in the literature, and notice what these all share. They all sa share two arsenic ethane diethyl moieties, which are going to interact with a cysteine-rich motif, but having this suite of biarsenicals uh, will give us a little more flexibility in engineering. We're engineering a cysteine-rich motif onto a structured element, not just on the terminus uh, of a protein. Okay, so getting a little more detail in our cartoons before we get to real data. The, uh, what we're asking is whether we can engineer in a tricysteine motif, not in the active site. Putting cysteines in the active site would simply just destroy the activity uh, of the target phosphatase. But cysteines at a place that's outside of the active site, such that we create a tricysteine potential allosteric site that upon binding of a biarsenical will uniquely inhibit the activity. So, <clears throat> This is how we did it. We actually found a place in the PTP domain, but outside of the active site, that already has one conserved cysteine. So this is just a partial sequence alignment of a bunch of different PTPs. Again, don't worry about their particular names. But you can see there's one cysteine that's highly conserved, essentially among all PTPs. It's adjacent to a place 368 that never has a cysteine in any <coughs> wild-type PTP. 
And it's cl not close in primary sequence space, but close in tertiary sequence excuse me, three-dimensional space to another position that is almost never cysteine. But here's one example, SHIP2, that has a cysteine there. So the vast majority of phosphatases only have one cysteine. A, a smattering may have two cysteines, but the important thing is no naturally occurring PTP has three cysteines at that position. So with a minimal amount of mutation, one cysteine there and one cysteine there added with the naturally occurring conserved cysteine, we could build in a tricysteine binding site uh, on the surface of the protein, which is right behind the active site. A key criterion for this approach is that, we're, again, we're not just messing up the function of the enzyme through the protein engineering. And so just to show you, don't want to dwell on michaelis metton data too much, but here, is, here are the kinetics of wild-type PTP. Here are the kinetics of now allosterically sensitized, or AS, PTP1B, uh, and you can see uh, they're very similar uh, in catalytic rate constant to one another. Are they inhibitable? Here's a screen done at 100 nanomolar uh, of different biarsenicals, the four I showed you earlier, and indeed we get about 50% inhibition at a pretty low concentration of biarsenical with two of them, REASH and ASI5. And if we look at dose dependence then, we see a nice, clear dose-dependent inhibition of the allosterically sensitized PTP1B with an IC50 of, yeah, right around 100 nanomolar uh, or so. Is the strategy general? And so the, remember, the potential payoff of this engineering approach is there's nothing special about the prototype. We intentionally picked a place that any PTP, we could simply through primary sequence alignments identify the corresponding mutations. We did that with a phosphatase called DEP1, made the allosterically sensitized DEP1, and indeed we see strongly inhibited, uh, this time ASI5 is the strongest inhibitor, no effect on wild type De DEP1, but the mutant uh, is strongly inhibited with an IC50 now, all around uh, 10 nanomolar or so. We've applied this now to several other PTPs, and we haven't, done, haven't had time yet to do all the biarsenicals on all of the PTPs, so this is data with just the prototypical biarsenical flash at 50 nanomolar, but in every case uh, to date, we see significant sensitivity that's conferred by those two mutations at the allosteric site. So what about activation? Activation is a tougher nut to crack. There are very few examples in the literature of chemical, specific chemical directed activation of target enzymes. And the reason for that is just easier to mess up activity than to enhance uh, activity. So again, this might seem fanciful, target specific PTP activation. But to uh, approach this, we looked at a loop which has no naturally occurring cysteines. This happens to be SHIP2, which we used as a prototype, but you could look at this loop in any PTP and it wouldn't have any cysteines in it. It has some important, highly conserved positions. In fact, it's called the WPD loop because those are such strongly conserved positions. So we stayed the heck away from those. Remember, we don't want to mutate and just ruin the protein uh, inherently. But we identified three positions that are not strongly conserved and presented cysteines, or excuse me, introduced cysteines at those positions and looked at the <coughs> resulting uh, <coughs> mutant enzyme with the four biarsenical compounds I showed you earlier. And we saw, rather surprisingly to us, strong activation, uh, roughly five-fold over the unactivated protein uh, with the strongest activator, ASI3. We see this effect either with purified uh, activatable SHIP2 or uh, lysate from ACT2, uh, ACT SHIP2 expressing cells, in either case in a, in a dose-dependent fashion. And we've been able to now show this in cells, in these experiments, cells that express the potentially activatable SHIP2 are incubated with ASI3, and then the ASI3 is all washed away, washed away, and then, then only after it's washed away are, this, are the cells lysed and the resulting lysate has uh, increased activity. And remember I told you these biarsenicals are fl also fluorescent molecules. We can use that to confirm binding. If we run those, that lysate out on a gel, we see only a single fluorescent band. So that's nice uh, evidence that the molecule is acting quite specifically inside the cell, and that band corresponds to the molecular weight of SHIP2. Why does this work? Why does it activate? 
Well, I, I have to say there is some serendipity in this. We, we didn't know this would happen. But when we look at what is known about this loop that we've engineered, this WPD loop, these are actually two crystal structures of a PTP overlaid. And the only significant difference between those two crystal structures is that one is in the open form, one is in the closed form. And in the absence of any biarsenical, these open and closed forms are in pretty rapid equilibrium. And our, our best working hypothesis, we don't have structural data for this yet, our best working hypothesis is that in the tricysteine mutant, when it binds to ASI3, that favors the closed form, which is necessary for activity, because the closed, only in the closed form is that aspartate of the WPD sequence down where it needs to be to participate in the catalytic reaction. In good analogy with the inhibition approach, I told you before, in this activation approach, we've targeted a conserved sequence uh, of the protein. And so the prototype that we happen to pick, SHIP2, doesn't really matter that that was the prototype. It could potentially be uh, applied to any PTP. And so uh, simply by make, making a primary sequence alignment and identifying the corresponding positions, mutating those three positions to cysteine, and we have a couple examples where, indeed, it does look nicely translatable. Here is a potentially activatable PTP1B, and it looks almost identical to SHIP2, with strong activation uh, with ASI3. A less related PTP called HEPTP, uh, it's kind of interesting. Yes, it's activatable, but with a different optimal small molecule, ASI5, so it's just an indication that it's nice to have this suite uh, of biarsenicals, because while well, we're operating under the sort of primary gross assumption that all PTP domains are the same. They're, of course, not identical. Uh, and so we found that different PTPs can have different optimized activating partners. OK, circling back just a little bit. The story I've told uh, until now has all been about engineered proteins. And I hope I've convinced you that we can target engineered proteins. But of course, engineered proteins would never be targets of a drug, would never be target of a pharmaceutical. So this chemical biolog biological approach that I've talked about would only be used in cellular systems, engineered cellular systems, in which the mutated phosphatase is expressed in the cell. But what we've learned throughout this protein engineering has actually made us circle back to sort of a more traditional medicinal chemistry approach, uh, and has provided us with kind of what we think is an exciting example of being able to target a newly identified uh, allosteric site on what I'll call a real PTP, one that actually exists in humans, and one that is actually a cancer drug target in humans. So activating mutations of this <coughs> PTP called SHIP2 causes Noonan syndrome, which leads to cancer predisposition. Activating mutations are also the most common cause of uh, sporadic juvenile <coughs> myelomyositic leukemia, and upregulation in general has been linked to, to both uh, HER2 positive and triple negative breast cancers. So a little bit of a different story now. Now we have a real drug target, not talking about biocynicals anymore, not talking about engineering anymore. Could we inhibit this protein specifically. Well, the problem is the problem I told you about at the beginning of the talk is the SHIP2 active site looks like every other PTP. So it's not clear how we would make an inhibitor of SHIP2 that didn't inhibit many other PTPs. Let's take a little walk down memory lane. This is a slide I showed earlier in talking about the engineering approach. And I glossed over the fact that SHIP2 has a cysteine which is not present in almost all other PTPs. That's that site that's proline in essentially all other PTPs. So wild type SHIP2, now not engineered, but wild type has a unique cysteine, poten potentially a unique nucleophilic handle which we could use to direct electrophilic inhibitors for specific inhibition, specific allosteric inhibition, avoiding the problems at the active site. Problem is, we have no literature precedent. We have this cysteine, which is potentially targetable, but we don't know how. We don't have a small molecule lead. So again, we kind of cheated. There are no examples of targeting non-conserved cysteines in PTPs. So we went to see what was in the literature about targeting non-conserved cysteines in other protein families. 
So Jack Taunton's lab has done a lot of work in targeting non-conserved cysteines in kinases. Uh, Kayvon Chokat's lab has targeted uh, non-conserved cysteines in RAS. So there's other protein families and there are other small molecules out there that share two important features. Sort of drug-like small molecule stuff, to put it in a not very technical way, and an electrophilic agent that could potentially react with a cysteine. So the important thing about these molecules that were developed in Jack Taunton's lab is this electrophile, <coughs> this unsaturated cyanoacetamide, is not a great electrophile. It's not going to be reacting with cysteines willy-nilly. It's only going to react with cysteines when and if the rest of the small molecule drives binding through what we'll call a traditional drug-protein interaction. So it's only if there's no non-covalent interactions in sort of an honest-to-goodness pocket will the reaction with cysteine happen at that beta carbon. So we just remined this library that was already in the literature from Taunton's lab. We resynthesized it and remined it. It was, it was developed on kinases, but we didn't care. We knew it would be completely different hits than what had been found on kinases, but these are just a nice group of molecules to hopefully be able to identify a lead compound for allosteric SHIP2 inhibition. The problem is the active site itself of PTPs has a cysteine in it. So a lot of molecules might inhibit SHIP2, but you'd expect them to be completely non-selective. And so we not only screened these compounds, and I'm only showing a fraction of the data, but screened these compounds for inhibition of SHIP2, we did a counter screen of these compounds for SHIP2 in which we had removed that cysteine and put back proline, which is present in every other phosphatase. So with this counter screen, we were looking for molecules that inhibited SHIP2, but inhibited C333P SHIP2 to a lesser degree. We would expect that if they don't inhibit C333P SHIP2, that that would be evidence that they're acting at that cysteine, that unique cysteine, and they're not just going to inhibit any PTP willy-nilly. So, sorry, skipped over the fact that we did identify a compound that seemed to have significantly stronger inhibition of SHIP2 than the C333P SHIP2 mutant. <clears throat> we went on to show that that inhibition is time dependent, which is what we would expect for a covalent uh, inhibitor if that cysteine is interacting with that beta carbon uh, as a nucleophile. Uh, mass spec experiments are ongoing right now, so we haven't definitively shown yet that uh, C333 hit, hits that carbon, but we think this is nice evidence that it does. The dirty little secret that was on the previous slide but I didn't highlight is compound four that I just showed you is really not very potent uh, at all. So we're back in the realm of good old medicinal chemistry. We have a lead compound. Right? We have a lead compound. We can make derivatives in an undergraduate driven lab. Making derivatives is a slow and painstaking process, but we've got three to date. And I'm going to focus on this compound 4C because really with only three, to, only these three to date, We've already achieved uh, sort of, again, a surprising uh, increase in potency. This is now a dose-dependent uh, inhibition experiment where you can see an IC50 of about, oh, 5 micromolar or so and no inhibition of C333P SHIP2 at all. We're surmising, we're doing the experiments right now, we're surmising that this is going to translate to no inhibition against all of those other PTPs. Remember, all of those other, other PTPs have proline at that position, not cysteine. So, uh, in summary, I hope I've uh, convinced you that we can engineer novel biorecinical sensitivity uh, into PTPs in a way that's general. That is, a particular researcher can take their PTP, that's ex make readily predictable mutations, express that PTP in their cell type of interest, and then have a small molecule from a relatively small group of small molecules that can target specifically inhibit or activate their PTP of choice. Um, and in a somewhat surprising turn of events, we came back to medicinal chemistry, which we haven't done in my lab for a while, because these sensitization strategies uh, really led us to the identif identification of an allosteric site on a real and critical uh, PTP drug target. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all the people who did the work. Many, many Amherst undergraduates have, have contributed to, uh, to studies in my lab over the years, but 
I showed the work today of Cynthia Cho, Greg Knowlton, Adrian Chan, Samuel Kortner, uh, and Brennan Marsh Armstrong. I'd like to thank uh, the NIH and, of course, once again, uh, the Dreyfus Foundation for Funding, uh, as well as Research Corp and Amherst College. Thank you for your attention and be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so um, the arsine molecule they were using at the beginning, do you have confirmation? Was that binding to all three cysteines that you were we uh, think it making sure were in place? We think it must be because we've done a number, number of engineering studies which when we've just put in two cysteines, let's say, okay. we can see in vitro inhibition, but in either in a lysate or a cell, we don't, we don't see either... Inhibit, either the inhibition gets incredibly weak in a lysate and in a cell we can't see it. So we think we need, we think three is the magic number because you would need three to engage, yeah, tetra, tetra right. gets you full engagement of both. Okay. Three gets you half of one and one of the other and we think that's what's needed for uh, uh, an interaction that would actually persist in cells. Okay, yeah. so, so follow up, do you, yeah. you probably have, is there crystal structure data on the native protein? Are those three spots for the cysteines, they're all, uh, Proximate to each other, so that you could have a single molecule binding to so all of them. Yes. You know where they yeah, are. That I was assume, the design was predicated on that. Yeah. So in the in the inhibition strategy, those three spots are. We don't have crystal structure of our mutated proteins. We have crystal structure right. of the wild type proteins. Those positions. But you know where the positions those are. Those positions are yes, close together in space. And and that, so that was the design was predicated on that. Yeah. Right. So if I can ask one last sure. follow up, then so those three spots that you picked, uh -huh. uh, did you try other spots first before you? lit on the fact that those three worked best, or did you just serendipitously so get those three right so the first time? So we've done, so with the, the, the activation approach I talked about second, uh, we've done a lot of engineering on that WPD loop and stumbled somewhat serendipitously upon the, the activation. Um, the, the inhibition approach, there is, there, yeah, I might as well, I had, since the question was asked. One more slide. So this is not our work. This is work from 10 years ago. Um, but remember, in the inhibition approach, there are three cysteines, one of which is conserved. Right? So one of which is there already in all PTPs. And there was a report from about 10 years ago that this electrophilic compound, ABDF, will, will be attacked by cysteine 367 and inhibit the protein. This is, that's the conserved one. So nicely, it gave us a blueprint for that site actually is an allosteric site. But in terms of selectivity, the ABDF is not a useful molecule because one would expect from this result it would react with any PTP, and we've confirmed that in our lab. So it showed us that, ah, that site is an allosteric inhibition site, but we want to target, we either want to engineer in our own cysteines, or in the case of SHIP2, we want to target that other, the non-conserved cysteine. That was uh, really impressive that you uh, accomplished all that with undergrads. And I was wondering if you, not necessarily related specifically to your story, if you could just comment briefly on <coughs> if you have a, a, a strategy for how you can um, do this kind of research with undergrads. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. I'm not sure. I, I guess I have a strategy. <laughs> I mean, it's a hard, maybe a hard thing to uh, articulate. I mean, I think if, if anyone, I mean, a lot of people here have already succeeded, and so there are a lot of people here in there who could, could answer uh, the same question. I, when I approach any new student in the lab, I, w I really just try to think about is what is an interesting problem, but a, but a technically achievable one for a bright, motivated student who's not going to be here for five years or six years. You know? So you just, you just have to, you just really have to rethink what a project is from what we all learned in graduate school um, to end. Just for example, in our work, that a student in grad school, I did both synthesis and and also evaluation of the compounds I synthesized. For undergrads in my lab, they do one or the other. You know, so carve things up more than than would do for um, for a, a graduate level um, project. But you know, there's no getting around. I think lots of people in this room could corroborate this the, the frustrating aspect 
of it. It's uh, many wonderful aspects. The frustrating aspect is, you know, is really smart, motivated students, and they're gone so quickly. So it's, it's learning to, it's more learning to manage the turnover more so than really changing the way you approach science. My, <clears throat> my pleasure to introduce uh, today's last speaker, who has a lot of interesting connections to the Dreyfus Foundation. Uh, he was a uh, Dreyfus New Faculty uh, awardee, uh, teacher scholar, uh, as you can see from the program, and he's currently the Camille Dreyfus Professor of Chemistry uh, at MIT. Uh, Steve Buckwald has a, a startlingly uh, amazing record of doing interesting synthetic chemistry. He's invented new reactions. He's improved reactions. He's developed new ligands. His work has had an impact on industry. Uh, he's actually done a lot of useful things as well as interesting things. And... Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, be able to introduce him and to hear his talk on uh, asymmetric uh, uh, copper catalyzed uh, uh, hydro functionalization reactions. Steve? Great. Thanks. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, uh, as John said, I owe, I consider, I was thinking about this. I'm not a, I, I'm a quadruple dipper, right? So there were three that, that John mentioned, um, but he also he didn't mention the fact that my office and lab, you could say I'm a quintuple dipper, because both my office and lab are also in the Dreyfus building, which not only was the money originally came from the Dreyfus Foundation, but actually money for part of the renovation came from the Dreyfus Foundation. So I guess that would, that would go to six, but that's too many. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the work that we've been doing um, to modify, in particular, olefins. And I'm going to do something that I usually don't do, which is to have a little more uh, introductory material, because Mark told me I had to. And uh, the first thing, you know, because sometimes people wonder, well, why does anybody care about synthetic chemistry? And I think we should always ask that question of almost anything that we do. Why do we care about synthetic chemistry? And in particular, what I'm focused on is synthetic methods. And so I think probably the best reason is that we can make things that have never previously existed. Okay? So that we can, you know, you create new things. That's something of, of fundamental importance. If that if it stopped there, then you're butterfly collecting. So hopefully there are, there are things that are useful. And then what we can do is that we tailor the properties of the substances, either known ones or new ones. Uh, and this is really important in all kinds of different fields, pharma and material science and all our academic fields. And, uh, and actually, you've seen in, throughout the course of the talks today, in a, in a variety of different areas of chemistry, everybody has to use synthetic chemistry. Different levels of sophistication, but you need to be able to make compounds, and what you'd like to be able to do is to make them quickly and reliably, okay? Um, and so um, we also see that people prepare compounds to test different mechanistic, like Marsha, uh, hypo scientific hypotheses, okay? And um, there are all kinds of different scales. So mostly people make things on a small scale, but then, you know, there's medium, large, and manufacturing scale. And if we take as sort of one slightly more developed example, what happens in pharma, and my numbers may be off a little bit, but I think you'll get the idea, you, there's some original, for this is for small molecules, there's some original lead compound that either comes, usually it comes from some compound collection. Somebody has made it for some completely different reason. 
Um, they do some screening against biological targets. And then once they get a hit, you make enough to, you resynthesize it to make sure that it's actually the compound that you think it is that's having the effect and do some initial testing. And then you say, okay, well, it's got all these bad, you know, problems. It's not selective enough, just like in the, in the previous talk where you're looking at the, uh, the two different um, forms or, or types of the same sort of enzyme, and so you want selectivity between those. Kinases are a really good example uh, of that because there's so many different kinases. So you make new variations, derivatives with enhanced properties, bioavailability, pharmacokinetics, lower toxicity. Then you make grams for initial testing, and if then that goes well, you make kilograms for initial animal studies, and then you go to 10 to 1,000 kilograms for clinical trials, and then in the very small number that get past that, you, people are making tons. And each of these depend on the availability of reliable and general and scalable methods. And I can tell you there are thousands and thousands and thousands of new methods that have been developed, and there are very, very, very few that people use, okay? So that's the challenge. The challenge is make something that's going to be, develop something that's going to be of interest to you, okay? But also that if it, you're going to pretend that it's going to have some application, the application is going to be by other people, not just by you. Okay, um, so, you know, what can you do? Pharmaceuticals, you can make compounds for imaging, you can make, these are, these are things actually in my group, we've done all of these mostly, not so well, but we've done all of these imaging things for um, electronic materials, fluorescent probes, um, semiconductors, polymer related things. My polymer background is not good. All right, um, so, there's a big one, th th there's what we have had traditionally in organic chemistry is what I would call a carbonyl-based um, approach, okay? So it's a lot of polar chemistry and a lot of very reactive things. And now there is a move towards working on less reactive things. So CH activation, of course, is, is a very big, very hot area, um, both uh, figuratively and literally oftentimes, and also functionalization of olefins. And olefins, um, again, as Marcia nicely provided an introduction, they're all over the place, okay? Well, most of the olefins that, we, that you think about in terms of basic chemicals come from, from petrochemicals, and they're used on, you know, ridiculous scales, 156 million tons a year. It's kind of like you know, mind-boggling. So ethylene, propylene, butadiene, butenes, these are used all the time. And so one of the things we wanted to do is to see if we could develop processes to convert these both simple ones and also in very complex substrates selectively to more highly, higher value-added compounds. And so that'll be the first part of my talk and the majority of my talk. And then also to devise new reactions where we can replace sort of bread and butter reagents, so like Grignard reagents, things that we learned about in undergraduate organic chemistry. Okay, Grignard reagents are great, except that you have to make the compounds and they're like anionic and they react with a lot of things. We want things that are gentle and kind and only react with what we want them to react with. Okay. All right, and, and we want to do this in a way, again, that we can do this either on simple compounds, unactivated, or very, very highly functionalized, uh, complicated compounds. And so, like everything else in synthetic chemistry, there's a balance between reactivity and selectivity, and we want generality, right? We would like to have things that anybody with no background can use the chemistry in any area. That's our goal in everything that we do. Okay, so we're going to look at what are called hydrofunctionalization of olefins, and the thiolene reaction is a non-catalyzed example that we saw this morning from Christy, in Christie's talk. I'm going to focus on hydroamination, okay, and it's effectively the net reaction of an NH bond across an unactivated carbon-carbon bond, okay. It is sort of the simplest and in, in many ways the, uh, one of the most aesthetically pleasing ways that you could have to make an amine. Um, and I'm going to also talk a lot about chiral molecules, and I 
most of you probably know, it's important to be able to make selectively a single-handed molecule with uh, thalidomide being the, uh, thalidomide being the, the example that uh, most of us uh, grew up learning about as an excuse to do asymmetric synthesis, but now whenever the FDA, whenever you put in a chiral molecule um, is going <clears> to <throat> be improved, it's sold as a single enantiomer, okay, unless it actually racemizes during the, um, immediately in the body. Okay, and in particular, uh, there are all kinds, these are just some uh, simple examples of chiral amines in the pharmaceutical industry, but chiral amines, I mean, I've been told over and over, I love amines, okay, I've been spending my life doing aromatic amines, and now chiral amines, and in, in the pharmaceutical industry, basically for small molecules, if there's no amine, there's no compound, okay, or no compound of interest. That's obviously an overstatement, but there's a lot of that. Okay, so I'll get back to this. So, how does research take place? You know, we like to think that, um, you know, we, you're the professor, you sit in your office, you have these ideas, we're so clever and everything, but then there's the truth. So that's, the, that's what you tell your mother, okay? Uh, but then there's the truth, and so in this particular case, the truth is better than the story, which was I had a new postdoc, Xiaolin Zhu, who's now a professor at Nanjing University, and he came in and I said, well, come up with a new way to do asymmetric hydroamination. And, and I said, we published one paper on it and uses rhodium and just start there. And, you know, he came back like three or four months later at group meeting. And I talked to him a little bit. He'd say, you know, he wouldn't say very, he's kind of a quiet guy. And we're going to have group meeting and he's a little nervous and he goes to me, um, well, you know, uh, what you suggested that I started, it was a total failure. It didn't work at all. But he said it very nicely. And, uh, and I said, oh, that's, uh, you know, so that's normal. And I said, so what, what are you going to do now? He goes, well, I, I decided to try something else. And so this is what he came up with. He, he said, well, you know, you published, our group, meaning, uh, had published work on chiral copper hydride chemistry interacting with olefins. And he said, I thought it would be interesting if we could do that with, instead of we had worked on very activated olefins, maybe we could do it with less activated olefins. And maybe if we did it in the presence of a reagent like this, and these were invented and, or at least popularized by Jeff Johnson at UNC Chapel Hill, that maybe somehow this would react with this and we'd get the amine. And if we did it with the right ligand, it would be asymmetric. Now, that would be stoichiometric, and now we need a way to take this X group, which here is a benzoate, and have a stoichiometric reagent that would allow this to go back to the catalyst, okay? Because we need, that's the expensive piece. We want to use that over and over again. And I said, okay, well, I guess that sounds all right. And so he goes, um, all right, well, I'm glad you thought I could try it because I did it, and I get 97% EE and 99% yield. And I said, so for those of you, I mean, so you want 100, but if you get 99%, you're usually, yeah, that's okay. So I said, oh, okay, well, I guess you can work on this project if you want. That's all right. And he said, okay, good, good. So then he, he went on to do this. And, and one of the things, you know, really simple substrates oftentimes give a great result, and then you go to anything else, and they don't work, okay? And that's, you know... Those are great papers. They get published in JAXA, and then nobody else ever looks at them again. But what you want to do is you want to be able to handle, one of the problems with olefins is that when you put more substituents on them for metal reagents, they get less reactive. And so I was really excited. This one, where you have three substituents, tri-substituted, not only did the reaction give us a good yield and very good enantioselectivity, but there's only a single diastereomer. Okay, so of all the four, we essentially get one. So that was great. So I was really happy. Um, and now, actually, the reaction type it's, can be, is a little more complicated because I just showed you what we would call the Markonikov reaction. So that's the asymmetric version. There's also uh, another major unsolved problem is to do the anti-Markonikov addition. Okay. And there are variations where people have done some very nice chemistry to affect this, but they usually require the use of another stoichiometric reagent um, to do this in a way that is less desirable. So we, we would like to be able to do that too. Um, and it turned out that if this was an alkyl system rather than an aryl, then you get a total change in the positional selectivity, or aka regiochemistry, and this reaction works 
great. And it's actually done under such mild conditions that you can have very reactive functional groups, um, a, a terminal epoxide or a, a, an alk primary alkyl bromide, and that's fine. So that's good. So we were pretty happy. And then we went back, and I'm not going to tell you the details. We did some mechanistic studies, kinetic studies, to try to improve things. This is really great work done by Jeff Bandar and Ma Mike Pernot, Pernot, who are postdocs in my group. And they took a reaction that originally took 10 hours, and now it takes 10 minutes. Okay? And in addition, it can be run open to the air, and they generated a sort of a mixture that was air stable that could be sold and handled and easy to use. So that's what you want to do is to facilitate other people's use is get rid of glove boxes, get rid of complicated things, make everything as simple as possible so you don't have to have any particular um, expertise to run the reactions. Okay. We, we did mechanistic studies on this, um, and one of the key, because we didn't have so much understanding of what was going on, and what we were able to find was that the copper and hydrogen were added syn, and then the copper nitrogen bond was formed with retention of stereochemistry. And that limits the mechanistic possibilities for that particular step, although it's still, we still can't absolutely pin down things, so we resort to calculations. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I mean, good EEs, low catalyst loading, fast reactions, that's good. So another postdoc, my group, Shi Liang Shi, who's now a professor at Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry. And he was thinking about this, and he goes, well, you know, you got a problem. And I said, well, what's that? He goes, the problem is, is that you need styrenes for your reaction, and how do you make styrenes? You make styrenes by doing... Suzuki Mura or Nagishi couplings with a vinyl organometallic on an aryl bromide or triflate, and that is a wasteful reaction, right? Because you, you have to have that other metal component, and that's complicating. And he says, the best cross-coupling reaction is one that makes an, alk an aryl alkyne, which many of you know is the Sanagashira reaction, but is really the heck aerylation, because heck did it before Sanagashira, without, if it's without copper. And in the chemistry we do, it actually works much better without copper, so we got to give Heck his, his due. So Xi Liang says, I said, okay, well, you know, explain this to me. What do you, you want to do? He goes, well, there is a paper from Salamora and another one from Lelich, which shows that if you take an alkyne and this same copper hydride that's going to be our intermediate, in the presence of an alcohol, that you can convert the alkyne to the alkene. And what I want to do is I want to mix this and this and this and this and the silane all together at once. And now what's going to happen is the copper hydride is going to react with this. Okay? And it will have a question. It, it, it will do this. And now it, it has a choice. It can say, I'm going to react with this like it did on the previous slide when it was an sp3 hybridized carbon or can react with this and it's going to react with this with 100% selectivity and I'm going yeah yeah sure okay and then this is going to react again with the copper hydride and now all we need to have it do is completely change its selectivity by 100% no problem Okay, so now it doesn't care about the alcohol. It's going to react with this. And I'm like, you really think this is going to work? And he goes, well, actually it does, and I got 99% E when I did the reaction. So I said, oh, okay, I, I guess you can work on this. So it's really it's a, it's, it's a challenge to be a faculty member at MIT. It's really a struggle. Um, every day I have to push harder and harder with my coworkers. Okay, and so this worked, you know, this, I'm not going to, you know, I, I show examples because you want to see it doesn't work, it works with more than one thing, that's fine. And, and so, Xi Liang, he, he knew he was going to go back to China, he wanted an academic job, what is important? Impact factor, right? I'm like, what is that? And he says, we, I want to publish this Nature Chemistry, and I said, why? And he goes, because it's got a better impact factor than Jack's. And I said, okay. And he goes, but if we do that, we need some applications of the chemistry. I said, go for it. So he, um, oh, I'll skip that, forget it. So he came back with four applications, and I thought, this is great. I mean, this guy is unbelievable, right? He came up with four applications, and then I looked at the applications he had picked, and I got a little nervous. So 
the first one is an ADHD drug. And I'm thinking, like, hmm, I wonder what he thinks of me. And then the second one is an antidepressant. I said, well, he's got it pretty well nailed. And then it's an anti-dementia drug. Okay, and then a urinary incontinence drug. So it, gets, it gets worse, right? I mean, okay, well, that's fine. But the paper got in, and he got his job, so everybody was happy. Okay, and so what you want to do, whenever you do methods, I mean, I think one of the problems is that what people do is they, you know, take the easy things, and then when it stops working, they say, well, this is too hard, it can't work. And so this is why you want these people who, are, who have, like, no ability to stop. So not only Xi Ling Xi, but I had a, a graduate student who's now um, a Miller Fellow with Jeff Long at Berkeley, Yang Yang. And Yang Yang is a, a remarkable person in many ways. I would say he's the smartest and hard, hardest working student um, that I've ever had. And he will never take no for an answer. I give everybody in my group a month's vacation. And <clears throat> he came into me and he goes, can I take my vacation and go learn how to do DFT calculations? And I said, you know, it's your time you want to do. It. And, and by the way, that sounds great. Maybe my wife and kids and I can come with you to, uh, to learn how to do them too. So anyway, he did that. And uh, he wanted to look at, um, you know, unactivated olefins. So unactivated olefins are really, I mean, really super unactivated olefins are really, really difficult. And so he, he got fixated on transtubutene. It's a feedstock chemical. That sounds really good. It's a CNE news word. And uh, you have an insertion. And there are all kinds of reasons why this shouldn't work. We did calculations. The insertion is horrible. Uh, once you get here, why doesn't it isomerize, which would, of course, completely mess you up for what we want to do. But, you know, what the hell? Do the reaction. So first he did calculations, this is where, he, and, and it, it's like eight kilocalories worse from the, the activation energy than for styrene, so this didn't make us very confident, uh, but they did the reaction, and the one thing you have going for you is this is cheaper than THF, so we can use an excess of that, and then that's not a problem, and he does the reaction, and he gets 99% EE, okay, so that's like, oh, that's pretty good, and uh, and it actually works on a variety of fairly complicated substrates. All right. Um, and it works as long as you have a trans olefin. Cysts are not so good with this particular system. But if you have a trans olefin, you know, it can be butene, hexene, octene, more branched, functionalized, whatever. Very general, nice system. Um, and you can take billion dollar pharmaceuticals, make a derivative of them, and make diastereomeric products at the end as well, which is another trendy thing that um, my students love to do. Okay, so that was fun, and I will skip that. It's calculation. So I'm, then um, I'm going to change top, topic briefly. And again, this is something that's, that's newer in my group. And the idea, and this is, the person who's really done brilliant work in this area is Mike Crochet at University of Texas. Okay, so the idea is, can we take carbon-carbon unsaturation and turn it into the equivalent of a Grignard reagent? Okay, so traditionally what people have done is they've made Grignard reagents, so R, M, G, X, that we always write as R minus, okay, and that might indicate that that will react with an with an acid, it'll react with a carbonyl, it'll react with all kinds of different functional groups, and you won't have selectivity, right? And also, in fact, if you want to scale this up, this is actually a scary reaction to do on scale. The initiate, it's a heterogeneous reaction. The initiation is a nightmare. Um, and you need to have halides, and so environmentally, it's not a very good reaction to make the precursors as well. And so what we want to do is to have our copper hydride react with the olefin to make so we, we want, eventually, to be able to make this or this. In the case I'll tell you about, we're going to make this. And then we want it to react with the ketone or carbonyl compound to um, effectively do this reaction, but also do it in a stereo-controlled manner. All right, that's the goal. Now, the problem is, is that it's well known that copper hydrides actually react with ketones right, or with CN double bonds, right? So you have to find a system that likes what is normally viewed as unreactive compounds more than they like reactive compounds, 
and makes an intermediate that is still reactive enough to then react here so that you can get the chemistry that you want. All right. So um, we started off looking at the reaction of imines. So we're going to do this carbometallation reaction asymmetrically. This is going to react with the, this particular type of imine to give this intermediate. Here's our product where we're going to get uh, a chiral amine out and then turn it over as before. And again, we need the selectivity. This is work done by, both by Yang Yang, who I mentioned before, and Ian Perry, who's a, uh, <coughs> a, a senior undergraduate in my lab. Okay. Um, and so here are the examples of the reactions. That's not, not particularly important. But what's important is why does it work? Okay, because you know, if I had written this in a proposal to NIH, it would have gotten completely trashed because they, they would have said there's no possible way this reaction can work until we had the result, okay? And so we were able to use a combination of calorimetry and theory to understand why it worked. And it has to do with the ligand. And the structures are not particularly important at this point. But so there's DTBM segfos, you can consider that the blue, and phenyl BPE, the green. And when you do a reaction by calorimetry, you can see that this imine reduction is fast here with this ligand. This is the ligand we do with the hydroamination chemistry and relatively slow with the phenyl BPE. We did by calculations the relative rate of the insertion reaction and showed that they're actually the same for these two. So the good reaction's the same, and the bad reaction's much slower with the phenyl BPE. So that's the reaction that we're able to use to do this chemistry. OK, and now can we do this with ketones? And again, it's even more challenging with ketones, because copper hydrides love ketones. Um, so this is, again, the same um, slot. Oh. Well, there we lost the slide. So the answer is yes. The paper was published in Science. Fortunately for everybody here, I won't be able to show you the examples, but we did this reaction, and we did a number of examples, but the, the one most impressive to me was Yang did a reaction on a 50 millimole scale with 0.2% catalyst um, in something like 85 to 90% yield and 98% EE and 10 to 1 diastereoselectivity. So it's nice. The chemistry scales incredibly well. It works well on a small scale, works well on a large scale. We're trying to see... Um, can we, this case published here is a special substrate. We want to be able to generalize that and not just make this one. We want to be able to ha understand the basic chemistry so we can make this one as well. And we would like to, you know, eliminate the use of any alkyl grignard larger than methyl and make this replace it. Will we succeed? Yeah, probably not. But, you know, it's a good thing to shoot for. Okay. So remembering that Monday is Halloween, this was last year at Halloween. Uh, this was in my lab. This is, uh, we have, no. This was, at, we went, we had a, uh, a bowling party um, at Halloween last year, and we had one scheduled for Halloween um, this year. In Massachusetts, bowling is unusual because normally bowling pins look like this. In Massachusetts, bowling pins look like this. Okay, so you have to drink a lot of beer to be able to throw the balls which are this big fast in order to get a decent score, which is 100, whereas regular bowling is much, it's much greater. Okay, uh, I have a spectacular uh, group of people. I, their names were on, on the slides. I won't go over that again. I'm enormously grateful uh, to them. As you can see, I don't really have to do very much. My, my job is, is mostly not screwing them up and uh, uh, raising money. So, so far I've been okay. I'm very grateful to uh, NIH and also Strem and Aldrich in this case. And actually one of the big problems we had initially was how you determine EEs on some of these compounds. And so we had a lot of help from actually three different groups. That, that, that was what was rate limiting. So Christina Crammel owns a company called Lotus Separations, which is a Princeton. Um, and Chris Welch and Eric Rigaldo at Merck. And then Tim Swagger and his postdoc uh, Yan Xuan Zhao actually came up with a really cool fluorine uh, NMR method, and all those together allowed us to get the uh, enantioselectivity. So anyway, I, you know, I uh, when I got invited to do this, I, I don't really have a choice, right? As you see, I'm a four or five dipper, 
And so if the Dreyfus Foundation comes calling, it's hard for me to say no. Um, so, but anyway, it's always, it, it, it's fun. It's good to come to New York. Uh, it's also good to leave New York. But, um, and even though I hate the Yankees, I, uh, I still like to come to New York. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. They don't work as well, right? What happens when you try the cis uh, So when you try the cis olefins, the reactions. It depends on what. Some of the reactions they don't work. Some of them work. Okay, like for the hydro, the basic hydroamination with styrenes, they work. It turns out the reactions are enantioconvergent. I, as I told the postdoc, this absolutely means that we're getting an isomerization reaction occurring. And then we did the experiment, the deuterium labeling experiment, and there's no isomerization. This, the, the ligands we were using, which we did not invent, Takasago did, are so directing that, that's the, that you still get the same enantiomer. Okay? But the reactions are slower because you, you put the, uh, one of the groups into a quadrant where the ligand is, and you have a negative interaction, so that slows it down. But it's easy. It's easier to separate them initially and just use the mixture. You could do either one. But it's, it's like when you want, you know, it's like for the student, the uh, aesthetics of it is, is, you know, you want to be able to say the reaction is over in seven hours rather than the reaction is over in 20 hours, right? So I prefer to do that. I'm important because I'm the person standing between them yeah, and the bar. Yeah, yeah, that's my line. Oh. <laughs> well, you took my line to begin with, so why can't I take your line? I mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Great. Thank you.